thing to do um, to record it because that's helpful as well. Um, and and on, on, on the uh, issue of uh, tech problems, um, people are often nervous. You're going to do the exams in due course online uh, with PeopleCert, with their proctor. Um, last year, PeopleCert divorced uh, the learning event from the exam. So they kind of take over at exam time. So it's, it, it's good in some ways because you have the ability to schedule the exams to suit your own time frame. So some people like to leave a bigger gap than others. Other people like to crack on straight away. But um, you're in people's hands for the exam. We prepare you for it, but you need to, uh, you, you need to focus on, you need to schedule that with people cert themselves. Um, um, and, and as I say, Mark, you'll get the link this morning, you'll get to do that. Um, but uh, in the exam as well, if you get tech problems, again, don't, don't, don't worry. Uh, just come, come back in. Um, the exam system pauses time and you don't lose any work that you've already done. So, yeah, so try and be quite relaxed about that and so on. Um, also, you know, as, uh, as uh, Glenn just said, if someone comes to your door, the Amazon man, don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> go and answer it. Well, you should miss. I'll try and make sure you don't miss anything. Um, I know some people have got one or two commitments later on in the week. We'll try and work around that. Um, people often have interviews and so on. Uh, so, you know, just like a real, real, real face to face event. And also, don't worry if we meet dogs and kids and cats. That's brilliant. <laughs> uh, it's always good to meet, uh, meet people's uh, children. We've met lots of children over the last few years. We've met some lovely dogs and cats. Um, we had a couple of hamsters once, they were quite nice. Um, so don't worry, we, we had some quite amusing stuff as well. Um, a while a while back we had a, a, a lady from Germany on the course, but she was she was uh dialing in from Wales, which is where I am in I'm in Cardiff. And um <clears throat> she was quite an a, a, an enthusiastic lady, was Christiana. And just before we started at the end of the uh, at, for the afternoon session, she screamed very loudly. So I'm like, well, Christiana, what's the problem? What's the problem? So oh, my mouse has, sorry, my, my, my cat has brought me in a, pre, uh, a present from the mountain. And I said, well, it's a mouse or a shrew. She said, no, it's a snake. Uh, and I said, oh, right, it's probably a grass snake. And she said, well, it's got black zigzags up the back. And I went, yeah, yeah, that's a viper. Uh, and we had to watch while Christiana put, I think she put a washing up bowl over it, weighted it down until she could deal with it properly uh, and, and so on. And we had a lady in Bridgend, we, I, some of my delegates still, who oh, I've seen again, uh, remind me of this. Um, uh, we had a lady who was working in a glass conservatory in Bridgend. And she said to me, Tone, I'm really hot in this conservatory. And I said, can you not move to, uh, uh, can you not move to a different vent, you know, a different room? She said, no, the internet's best here and so on and so forth. And she said, but it's okay, we've got a hot tub in the garden. And I'm going to jump in the hot tub over lunch. And I went, oh, that's, that'll be good. And she said, oh, no, here comes my husband about to jump into the uh, hot tub. Uh, and we saw more of a husband than we probably would have wanted to um, at that point. But, you know, stuff happens. So don't worry about it. It's only us. Um, and I hope you uh, enjoy what, what is without doubt a fairly intense course. Um, and uh, I can't, I can't uh, move away from that. Uh, it's probably the most intense course that I give. Uh, I do a lot of training in the agile world and in program management and change management generally. The Prince 2 course, we have a lot of ground to cover, uh, which is why we encourage the pre-work and so on and so forth. So um, <clears throat> the other thing you may notice, very high tech presentation material, very high tech presentation material. Um, and it's, I'll be honest with you, it is deliberately, uh, deliberately low tech um, because um, the way, the way we're going to work is I'm going to do lots of scribbling in my inimitable left-handed scroll here uh, at the flip chart. And we can we can refer back, flip back and forward to it as well, um, as much as we need to over the next few days. And you will find, for example, things that I do today will be very useful to when we to you when we when, when we uh, uh, when we um, start to build up to the practitioner exam, particularly on Thursday. So it's deliberately low tech. It's deliberately low tech, or we'll be flishing back, back and forth, and so on. Um, the other thing I've um, I've sent you all, and Kareem sent it to you, Mark, on uh, Saturday, I believe, is I've sent you the the uh, presentation file um, which supports the course. Now, notice I say supports the course rather than drives the course. Um, we, I don't we don't do death by PowerPoint. 
death by PowerPoint is, is awful, you know, just wading through PowerPoint. A lot of people, when they do these kind of courses, they just, people just have to listen to people plowing through PowerPoint. That's a deadly dull way of passing the exam. So we're not, I'm I'll, 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 sorry, I'm I'll, I'll spending time together as well. So we're not going to do that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a chat for a few days. Unfortunately, we've got a chat about prints too, but you can't have everything. I'm with you in a minute, Helen. Um, um, and I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to have lots of scribbling here. Um, feel free to take screenshots, you can anyway, but feel free to take screenshots, whatever helps you. Might help you with the practitioner exam, as we will discuss. And um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll use the, um, the PowerPoint, just some of the PowerPoint, but not all of it just to summarize sessions. So we'll use, so it's gonna be a, 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 an event supported by PowerPoint rather than driven through it. Um, and, um, but it's also useful to you, I think, within, uh, I, I designed and developed the course um, and within the constraints of the accreditation, because all courses have to be accredited by the examination board. I've tried to make it as punchy as I can. It'll help you review the day and help you with the foundation exam. Helen, how can I help you? Sorry, no, it's okay. I, I didn't think I'd received the um, the slides, but I'm just I'm trawling through. I found them. You sent them last Tuesday to me. I sent them um, really last week, yeah, because I was I knew I was going to be away Friday uh, afternoon, so I sent them to you. I think Monday or Tuesday, something like that. Yeah. So I had problems with receiving the emails because of the spelling of my surname, but sorry, yeah, I've got them. I found them now. Oh, don't worry. But you've got it through, have you? Oh yes. Oh yeah, yeah. We had lots of trouble with WT Co. and and, and the and your your apostrophe and so on. Yes, because even with people cert, when I've had when I've registered with people cert to download it, they just will not accept my surname because they they just don't believe you have an apostrophe in your name. I, so. And uh, the reason I know this, my daughter is married to a gentleman called Connor O'Malley, so she became Co uh, Emma O'Malley, and she has the same problems everywhere. Yeah, very frustrating. I'm glad it got through in the end. I know where there was a few bit of toing and froing about that, wasn't there, a while ago getting that sorted out. Too much literal database design. That's your problem. Say again, sorry. Too much literal database design. Oh, I don't know. That sounds very technical, mate. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. but oh, it's, sorry. it's a problem in so many places, I think, for people with a with apostrophe and so on. Yeah. Don't accept wildcards in the in the surname. Oh, is that what it is? Ah, okay. Uh, I know. Okay. And also we have some people who have special characters, it's difficult as well, is it not? Mm -hmm. So let's just introduce the the style of how we're uh, how we're gonna run the, the course. So um um I think we've got everyone here now. So, uh, yeah, that's good. Let me just do something quickly, if I will, just to uh, just to make sure we got everyone. Da -da -da. Right. So I just start to think about uh, uh, our uh, our objectives, if I may. No questions before we go any further. Just to introduce the morning. Cool. So let's just talk about what we're going to do this week. And again, as I say, deliberately low tech, low tech, um, as you'll see. So uh, our objectives. <clears throat> uh, the objectives are fairly straightforward. Um, what? Let's just make sure you can see that. Yeah. What we want you to do is to understand this framework for project management called Prince Two. And it's really important to recognize right from the outset that everything is based upon, and I've got a hard copy, um, uh, the, the terminology and the concepts employed. Yes, Gareth. Um, I think I think Kareem's already told you that, to be fair. Um, it's a good idea. If you, people like hard copies quite often. We've got, we got an online PDF. I just wondered if you thought that was enough for your oh. recommended you buy it. Enough, but if you prefer a book, a book's, you know, it's your call, Reed, if anybody can't get them to Swansea, you know, as I recall, that one book never showed up, did it, for Agile PM? Oh. <laughs> yeah, um, you, you, um, so everything is based on the concepts and terminology in, in the, uh, yeah, bear with me, Anna, I'll tell you, uh, um, in this book, yeah. So um, when you when you register with PeopleCert, uh, uh, you get an e-copy e of this, which is searchable and editable. So you should all have that, apart from Mark, who will get it this morning if he wants it. You can purchase a hard copy. The best way to get them is Amazon. Amazon gets them. We have to buy them through the, the exam board, which is PeopleCert. You can get them cheaper than we can on Amazon if you feel you need a book. 
Um, and the book, Anna, yes, is usable in the uh, practitioner exam, but not the foundation exam. So uh, the reason I stress that it's all based on this book is we often get people who've come from other project management disciplines, perhaps um, Association for Project Management uh, or Project Management Institute uh, bodies of knowledge. But we now have to undo that, if you like, and, and use the terminology in this book. Now, when I say understand it, I mean, understand the principles upon which it's based, understand the structure of the approach. And, and you will see that as well as principles, we also have themes, processes, and products. Again, obviously we'll be covering all that. Um, understand the terminology used. And again, I've started to use that as well. So we've got to base ourselves on the terminology. We, we also hope that when you leave this course, you feel that you've got something you can usefully apply in the workplace. What, what I don't do is just coach for exams. Um, what I want you to do is to feel that you, 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 uh, you, you can use a physical copy if you want to, um, is that you've got something you can usefully use uh, in the workplace. And the third thing we're going to do is to prepare you for the PRINCE2 exams, which are controlled totally by PeopleServe. So what we do is we, uh, we arrange for you to receive vouchers. Um, by registering on the PeopleServe portal, you, uh, you can download the PDF, uh, the digital book, if you like. And you then can schedule your exams to suit your own timescale. And there are two exams based in this uh, that we're preparing you for. One is the foundation. And we will have covered the ground for that by Wednesday p.m. By close of play Wednesday, and it's quite often quite a slightly earlier finish, uh, we will have covered the ground for foundation. And to be honest, and more, and more, to be honest. And then what we do is we move into practitioner. And we will spend all day Thursday coaching for practitioner. And then we will also, for those that want it, we do a drop-in session on Friday morning to consolidate and answer last minute questions. So that, that's, the, that's what we're gonna do this week. Now, I always think there are two ways of running any kind of learning event where there's an examination uh, aspect to it. And one way of doing it is focusing purely on exams. And in my industry, we call this being an exam factory. And it's a really easy thing to do for me, to be honest, because all we have to do is I sit here and persuade you that together we need to plow, I think plow is a good word, uh, chapter by chapter, page by page, paragraph by paragraph through this fascinating book. Um, I persuade you to underline or highlight key phrases and uh, we all lose the will to live in about 45 minutes. And it only really focuses on one of our objectives. Um, and this still doesn't give any guarantees. So our approach is very, very different, well, very different, yes. We believe essentially that the exam success should come through the understanding, through the learning. So what we're going to say is, OK, if we can get you understanding it and certainly on Thursday applying it, we believe you should be well prepared for both exams. And you should also go away feeling that you've got something you can usefully use in the workplace. So we believe that essentially not that the, particularly the foundation exam, to be honest, the, um, the, the, the exam success should come through the learning. So those are our objectives. Time scale. Okay, so we start at nine o'clock and we should be finished on camera by five o'clock uh, most days. Yeah, so we've already got a project because we, uh, we've got to start and end. Yeah, and now we know the projects are temporary endeavors. Um, so generally, um, we're building quite a lot of breaks. And you know, it's quite tricky being on camera all day. I know that. So we have scheduled breaks, but if also if anyone feels that they, you know, they just need a break and I'll be watching, I'll be trying to keep an eye on the cameras and get a feeling for it. 
we, we, I might often call uh, a couple more breaks as the day goes forward, but we generally have the first break around 10.30, where you can grab some coffee or whatever you feel the need. Lunch is generally, it's an imprecise science, so it's around about 12.30. Um, I'm kind of in your hands about how long you want to take over lunch. You can be an empowered group and make that decision. But I always recommend, you know, people generally want to get on with it. So we generally stop for lunch for about 40 minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes, maybe. That, 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 that works within the overall time frames. And uh, we grab another break here. But as I say, there may well be um, you know, more breaks if we need it as we go through, because there's a lot to do. Um, so that, that's, how, uh, that's how it works. And if we have some structure, we need some uh, content. Here is the detailed content of the week, the detailed agenda, if you like. We're going to start off talking about Prince 2. I, I guess you'd be just surprised if we didn't, to be honest. Then after coffee, we're going to do some more. I thought we'd do a bit more after lunch. And more again before we come off camera. And that's our detailed timetable, which is deliberately vague. There is a blow-by-blow -blow account of how it will work within the uh, uh, within the, the documentation you you have, but it's important to recognize. I often change the change the uh, sessions to suit the group. Um, I've done quite a few of these. You see that actually, I was involved in setting up uh, a a prints in the early days and b the exams in the very early days. So you kind of have to trust me on timings. Um, but and su but suffice to say, by the time that we get through this. Um, we will have covered all the ground. And, and that essentially is Monday through Thursday. Although we might finish a little earlier on, on, th on Thursday. Um, and in an ideal world, um, that would be it, wouldn't it, really? We could uh, go away and get on with what passes for a normal life and so on. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be an ideal world, as the Welsh Rugby Union are finding out at the moment, I'm glad to say, um, for those of us in my part of the world. Um, because I do have to suggest you might benefit from, which is basically, please, will you do some evening work? Uh, and I always hate asking nice people if to do evening work, and I'm sure you are nice people, um, because you know it's it's a tough it's tough when you've had a full day with me as well. But it's kind of essential to getting through what we're going to do. Now, if I'm honest, I'm not sure how much evening work there is, but it's probably going to be around about an hour and a half or so. A lot depends on how you feel the day has gone and, and, and how, you, how, how much you, you, you've absorbed. And it's a combination of things. Firstly, reviewing the day. Reviewing the day, making sure that you're up to speed with where we are. And I'll be sending you email at the end of every day to, just to remind you of what we've done and, and other things to help you review the day. Getting more to grips with the manual. And you need to make sure, you know, by the time we get out of this, you, have, you need to, the manual needs to be your friend. You need to know your way around it. So for the practitioner exam, you can use it. You can personalize it. You can highlight uh, key phrases. You can put page divider tabs in. If you feel anything I do up here during the week is useful. You can draw it up in any, you can scribble up those notes or diagrams on any of the blank pages. And I will also, again, as the, as the week develops, send you some sample papers, which will help you with your exam prep. So, uh, Anna. I asked the question in the chat, but I don't think it was clear. My question is about the use of the manual during the exam. If I don't have a physical copy, can I use that PDF copy? Absolutely. The, the, the medium in which the manual is available doesn't matter. You can either use physical or PDF. And the, the PDF exam. is searchable and is editable. But the, i done the exams with people said before, and they they don't allow you to, you know, the, the, the system close all the apps. Yeah, you have, to, you have to download. That's why I sent you the last Tuesday, I sent you their exam guidance. You have to download some software called Exam Shield, which closes yeah, up the rest of your environment. Yeah, true. I have that as well. But then how can you use a PDF copy if that environment well, allows you? 
you can trust me you can it's, it's available yeah you can you okay. can you you can use the printer two manual for the practitioner exam i promise you okay if not i was thinking if i need one i will order one but it's not enough time probably by well, i mean i'll be honest with you that's a call a lot of people do like the physical book the hard okay. copy a lot of people do like a hard copy book if you want to there's a re you know you can use that instead of the pdf you can use either Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you can use either, but I promise you, Exam Shield. I know, I know what you mean about it closing off the rest of your environment. I understand, uh, but you, uh, it allows you to use um, your 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 manual. It's it, it's really part of the, it's part of the deal. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. No worries. Okay, so uh, that's the structure of our week, and then what we'll do on Friday. So that's uh, that's uh, Monday to Thursday. And then what I arrange on Friday morning, which starts again at nine o'clock and goes on for as long as you want it to. Um, it's optional. Some people feel they've had enough of me by then, I'll be honest with you, they don't want to come along. Um, but we run a sort of informal drop-in session, a drop-in session where, you know, we can reflect on the week. I can go over any ground you want me to. Uh, we can go over any extra work you've done and so on and so forth. I'll be honest with you, it generally only lasts a couple of hours. It certainly never goes on beyond lunchtime, but if you wanted to, we can. I'm here I'm here to do that. And that just gives people a chance to uh, to come and ask any final questions and I can give them some final practitioner exam coaching. And it's a good session to come to, I would say. So um, that's the structure of our week. Um, as I say, if anyone has to miss anything, it's useful if you could let me know if you have to go to anything. I know one or two people have, um, and I'll make sure I try and recover things for you. But of course, you always have uh, you always have the uh, the um, recording. You always have the recording. Um, handouts, as I say, this is the main handout. Okay, this is the main handout um, with with the people search system. You get it electronically. Um, um, Irritatingly, the page numbers in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, electronic version are different to the hard copy. So I'll be trying to reference both of those as we go through. Uh, I'm with you in a minute, Alice. Um, um, I've also sent you this. I'll explain what this is later in the week, later today, which is my view of a process model, which I think will help you. Um, so those those are the main handouts. You, you need to get to grips with that manual. I, can I, is it Oles or Oles? Oles, um, Oles? Am I'm I sorry. pronouncing your name right, my friend? Uh, okay, uh, uh, there are question. Uh, there are two versions of this book. Uh, one is the 2017 edition, yeah. and also one 2021 edition. Is there a difference between these editions? It should say the, sixth, the latest edition is the, the sixth edition, which is also known as the 2017 edition on physical copies. Um, but you might find it 2021 on people's so Is that what you're saying? It's a uh, it's a sixth edition book. Is there, are, there are no uh, diff difference. But it uh, choose 2017, it's not 2021. Understand correctly? Um, I haven't seen it. Where 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 have you seen it? Say 2021 edition. Uh, I will send you a link uh, during our break. Okay, it's probably yeah. Send me the link then, if you will. It's it. it, it the, the latest edition was was pulled together, was constructed in two thousand and seventeen. So if you see my book, it says two thousand and seventeen, but it's it should really be known as the sixth edition, the sixth edition. And if you look in here, in the IPR page down the bottom, if your manual says sixth edition, that's the right one. There is nothing, there is no formal 2021 edition. The, 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 link, the link from people so may call it that, but it's the sixth edition manual. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, no more questions. So let's think about these exams, because that's always a great way to start a Monday morning, I think. Don't you think, talking about exams? So ah, uh, there are two exams built into the, 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 that we cover the syllabus for us, the best way of describing it. Uh, it's about 400 pages. But I, I yeah. I got a work spread that I can access, but uh, yeah, just, just that big. Um, is Gareth, are you asking me, can you wear headphones? 
It says in the, just looking at that exam shield thing, it says you have available wired headsets as they're required for listening and speaking part. My MacBook as USB-C, I've right. got There's Apple no, That's a general set of guidance for all their exams. There's no listening okay. talking. So they won't let you wear the headphones. I can tell you that now. Um, the, the, when you run the exam, when you sit the exam with people, so I'm sure Anna might remember this, um, you don't see the proctor as they call them, the invigilator. Uh, but they're they're pretty um, they're pretty pretty um, precise in what you can and can't do. Uh, so, for example, they won't let you wear headphones. Um, they, we've had, we, they've, it depends who you get. I'll be honest with you, but I've often people have often been asked to take off uh, smartphones um, to take sorry take off smartwatches. Um, they generally uh, ask you to do a three sixty with your camera. Uh, to make sure there's nobody else in the room, nobody hiding under the table. And they'll check that you haven't got any other documentation other than your manual. They generally ask you if you have got the hard copy to do that. Um, so um, you don't need headphones for the exam. Well, Anna, why would you need headphones? Sorry. They don't so actually, I think so if you look at the exam instructions, unless they've changed them, but please look at the documents I sent you last week. Uh, the wearing of headphones is not permitted, but I may be wrong now. If they've updated that, you may have about more information than me. It's just in your in your email um, under the exam shield downloads. Yeah. It says uh, you must have this, this, and this. But that's yeah. fine. If you say we don't need it, it's I just don't want to buy. I just don't want to buy wired headphones. That's no, 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 no. You don't have to. That's only it's, as I say the general instructions, which include a number of different exams, some of which have a, an audio element to them. But for Prince Two, there's no audio. Okay, so yeah, so the exam proctors can be quite precise. They want you to be in a, in a room where they can see that you're in a closed room with a door. Um, so just, yeah, I would take some time to look at those instructions, but there's no reason for any audio element to it. There's, that's, not, that's not what we have in Princeton. So let me take you through the two exams. We have two exams that we, we cover the ground for, that the syllabus is covered. The first one, is the foundation exam. Now, as I say, all the exams are controlled and run with people said. I won't be involved in, in supervising your exam. You, you, when, you, uh, when, you, when you registered, you can schedule your exams with people said, and I know some of you have already done that, at a time to suit yourself. So, you know, some people like to go in, a lot of people would do it the week after the course. That's quite good, I think, because you stay in the zone. Other people say, well, I want to take a little bit more time. Uh, I want to take a little bit more time and um, I, uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll schedule it a bit later. Once you schedule it, you can change you can change the time and date. So if you want to book an exam and you think, oh, I could do with a bit more time, you can change it, but you have to give them 48 hours notice. Otherwise, they will charge you a rescheduling fee. So providing you reschedule outside 48 hours, uh, you can get that free. Okay. So let me take you through uh, the foundation exam. The foundation exam is a test of knowledge rather than of competency. It, it, it's a test, if you like, of, of the theory of prints. No applying it. It's all based on understanding the basic ideas here. Yeah, so this is the foundation exam. But the way they do it, test it, is kind of by playing who wants to be a millionaire. Who want to be a millionaire? They, um, it, why I say that, except obviously the prizes aren't so great. Uh, um, but the way the way I say that is, they ask you a series of questions, and for every question, there are four possible options presented to you. It's a classic pick one from four multiple choice exam, and I think it's also a bit like who wants to be a millionaire. When the, whenever I see that program and the candidate goes 50-50, they usually take away the two stupid ones and there are two possible ones left. And I often find that of the four, two are pretty silly and there's two to think about. But you have to choose the right one from four. Yeah, and this is how it works. You just click your way through a number of questions. So let me just, uh, let me just tell you this. We'll, we'll uh, think about how this one works. So the foundation exam. Okay. 
Okay, both exams are online and you should schedule it with people. So it's a time to suit yourself. Um, and it's a classic multiple choice. Pick one from four. And I promise you there is only, there is only one right answer. And there is no interpretation here. There are always facts. And the facts actually drawn from a subset of the manual, from a, from a certain percentage of the manual. And later on this morning, I'll show you which parts of the manual are testable in foundation. It's not based on the whole manual. I'll explain. There are facts. Yeah. Now, facts from the manual. So there's no sort of what is the best thing to do here? Who is the most appropriate person? It's, you know, in which process do we create the risk register? Who is the ultimately accountable individual? Yeah. Uh, which of the following is a valid risk response? So they're all facts. They're all just facts. The annoying thing is no reference material allowed. No reference material allowed. It's closed book because it's essentially a fundamentals exam. It's closed book. Now, for those who are doing it in their um, in their first language, um, it's a one-hour exam. It's a one-hour exam. For those who are who have um, who have told people sir, that they are not working in their first language, I don't know how it works for Welsh, Glennis. I got to tell you, you might want to talk to people sir. Um, you get plus twenty-five percent on time so you get an hour and a quarter but it's down to you when you register with people should just to, to to make the point that you are um, you are sitting in in other than your native language and then you will automatically be allocated an extra 25 percent in each exam you're going to get 60 questions and any reasonable person would think 55% would be a pass. Unfortunately, it isn't. You need to get 55% to pass. So 33 out of 60. So 33 is as good as 60. 32 is as unattractive uh, as uh, zero. And with the online exams, of course, you get your, you get your result pretty much straight away. Uh, I wouldn't schedule it for three o'clock. Gareth, we've got a big group this week. We might run on a bit beyond that, but, you know, but I mean, see how you feel later in the week, I would suggest. There's usually slots which come free because people change their minds and so on. You put yourself under a bit of pressure, I think, if you, if you schedule it for precisely three o'clock. Maybe Wednesday evening would be fine if you wanted to do that. Or, or maybe some people like to do it after they've had the, the practitioner prep on Friday afternoon as well. You do, absolutely, four hours in advance, you do. And you have 48 hours to change your mind without charge. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. So people often worry about the uh, the, the number of questions in, in, the, in the allocated time. Um, it's, um, I've, I've honestly only ever had one person that I'm aware of who, uh, um, who uh, how can I put it, who um, ran out of time. Uh, and that's because essentially they didn't uh, try to, <laughs> they decided not to take uh, my advice. Um, because, you know, I would say a lot of the questions are on the surface. Yeah, are pretty much straightforward. Um, but some are, some are a little bit more hidden. So I, I think, but it's not, it's only my idea, my advice, that it's not worth getting stuck on a tricky one early, at the early part of the exam. So I always suggest what I generally call a rolling wave approach. So I would suggest doing a first pass through all the 60 questions, dealing with the critical mass, dealing with the ones you think I've got that, I've got that, I've got that. You can flag questions to return to. And then I would go back to the ones you flagged and, and have a go and look at those. Again, leaving any you're still not sure of behind. And then go back and so on. And by the time you've done that a few times, and you'll see the clock ticking down on the screen. You may have three or four 
you haven't got any idea about. So to be honest, you may as well guess. There's no negative marks. There's no deductions. You might as well guess. You know, they're all going to be labeled A, B, C, and D. Just make a guess and make sure you answer all the questions. So as the time ticks down, just return to them and do that as you will. So you can flag questions to return to and, uh, uh, and you, can, uh, you can change your mind. I, I would warn people, I don't know if anyone's done the, I, know perhaps, I think Anna has, has done these kind of exams before. There is a danger of starting to doubt yourself in the last five minutes. I see this all the time when I run other exams. So people are looking fairly cool, fairly relaxed, and then they start to they start to look for tricks which aren't there. If you feel that you're in danger of changing your mind unnecessarily, I would encourage you to close the exam down early. There's no reason why you can't do that. And you'll get your results um, in, within a couple of minutes. So do remember that the foundation paper you're not, oh, sorry, foundation exam, you're not allowed to use the manual for that. Any questions on that one? No, okay. What if you fail? Um, okay, well, if you fail. Just saying, <laughs> not that I think anybody will. Well, but, I mean, know, people, what people, if? I'll be honest, is people do fail. Okay, so um, if you fail, you can, uh, uh, you can book a reset through Kareem which would be cheaper than going through people search. However, I don't know if you noticed this, those of you that are registered, there is a facility when you register, which is called Take Two. Did anyone notice that on the people search site? Um, so um, it, uh, Take Two is, is, a, is a people search initiative, not ours. And the idea of Take Two is if, you know, I, personally, I think they're playing on people's insecurity, but that's me. Um, if, if, you're, if you're concerned about whether you're, you're, you're ready for the exam or you're going to pass or not, you can pay. <laughs> well done, Anna. You can pay for the Take Two facility, which is a very, very cheap reset. I think last time I saw it was £83, but I might be wrong now. They keep changing the prices. It's a new year. Um, and it's a bit like holiday insurance. You know, if you're on a holiday, you, 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 pay, you take out insurance so that if you're ill, you can get medical assistance when you're in you're on holiday um, and um, uh, and uh, you can get repatriated and so on and if you don't if you don't get ill guess what you don't get the money back and this is what this this is the best way I think of describing take two it's it's your decision but when, up to 15 minutes before the exam you can you can opt to pay for to buy off people sir not from not from us off people sir um, take two. Uh, and that means if you if you do fail, then they, you will have a very cheap reset with people said. But if you do pass, you've wasted that money. It's a people said thing. If you haven't taken out t uh, take two and you are unfortunately unsuccessful, uh, then contact Kareem at NLC and he will um, he he will arrange we we can arrange a reset for you at. At, 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 at better prices than going directly for people without take two, but it's not 83 quid. We can't buy it for that. We can't buy it for that much. We get, we get a discount from people for the vouchers, which we pass on to you. And all we do is pass on the exam fees. The other thing we're more than happy to do, um, if you are unsuccessful, you, we, we'll support you in any way we can. Uh, you can sit in on some of our sessions if you wish to. Uh, to build up again and so on and so forth, free of charge. All Kareem passes on is the uh, the exam fee, which is a couple of hundred quid, but I can't remember exactly how much. Can I ask what I'm is the? Free, I don't do money. What is the cost of the exam anyway? Uh, I don't. I don't know. If you go, I, I do know that if you go to people cert directly, and some yes. people just say I'm going to go for it to do the practitioner exam, it's the best part of five hundred pound. Just for the exam. Mm -hmm. People are surprised. Both, both of them. No, for the practitioner exam. Last time I saw it was 431. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big deal. This the exam board make all the money. People are, see, I can tell people are surprised. If you we often get people who say, Oh, I know this Prince Lark, I'm just going to do the exam. I'm going to book direct with people say I go, okay, fair enough. And the last time I saw, but I haven't seen if you look at the people search site and say, I want to book a practitioner exam, the last time I saw it, um, but I don't bother looking at, at those prices too often. It was 431 pounds plus VAT, just to do the practitioner exam. 
that include the course though? No, just the exam. Just, just the exam. Mm. People said a very, very affluent, <laughs> international, very, very, very affluent company. Yeah, yeah, exams are dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not sure what it is for, for practitioner foundation, but it'd be about it'll be about 300 quid, something like that. Check it out if you like. Get on the people's so site and say, "Oh, just Google how much to take a practice Prince Two practitioner exam with people." So you'll see the prices. People are often surprised. It really it's the exam board that you know make make all the money. And that's what happens then. You see, we get people who say, "I didn't take out. I take two. Can I? Can I? Can I do these reset for eighty? No, no, you, no, you, no. You have to. You have to make that choice before 50, at least fifteen minutes before you set your exam. Olas. Uh, hello. If uh, there will be some technical problems, like uh, there are no internet, there are some problem with uh, hardware. What what happened then? Um, I, you have to talk to people to. I mean. You, you, if you if your machine crashes, if you have internet problems during the exam, if you reboot, you won't lose any work and you won't lose any time. But you have to set up your own environment, really, you know. But uh, the question is: is if there are problems with internet, I, I understand that I don't lose any uh, my result, but I lose my time and I. No, you don't lose time. You don't lose time. When, when my internet connection breaks, then uh, all uh, measurement stops and all time. It's like pause in a video, not that a stream. Okay. It's a pause. Honestly, yeah. And if, you get, if you get really, really big problems, um, there's a customer support. Uh, talk to your proctor, or there's a customer support number which I'll send you, which you can you can phone them. But that's if you you know everything around you falls apart, really. And uh, we will make, uh, we will do it exams we uh, on, on the front of examiner or it's automatic software. I'm sorry, I I I didn't catch that. I'm sorry, Oz. Uh, we will uh, do these exams uh, on supervising of real person or it's uh, automatic exams. No, the, 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 pro the proctor, the individual, the guy supervising the exam is a real person. He will talk to you. You won't see them, but they will talk to you. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, Anna. So it's about the take two because I this course is funded for me. So uh, I think it will be cheaper for the funding organization to pay for the two in advance. So I don't know if you know who can I talk to instead of I don't know I don't know if how does I, it work? You know, you've been in that situation before. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I take two. I don't. Are you coming through React or something? I don't know. Take take two. Um, I don't know how that's you. You have to fund that, is my understanding. But anything about that, you should talk to Kareem about. But take two is is something which I think you have to fund yourself. Uh huh. Okay. So yeah, think of it as I mean, you've been through before, Andrew. I think think of it as uh, on other exams. Think of it as holiday insurance. No, I, I know, but previously I didn't pay for that. That my organization pay for that. But now uh, that. I, 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 my understanding is your organization, NHS, yeah, I don't think they have, I know they haven't paid for it, take two. They have, they paid. They haven't. Yes, they have. I ah, know, well, well, uh, this time, I don't know, but the, I did the, on Friday the IT uh, service management and I had the take two and I had the mock exam and everything. I, I don't think they have with Kareem, but you need to check. I don't know. I, I, okay, okay, yeah. So can you, I, can you put the email, that email on the chat? Karim, I don't know who is Karim. Okay, all right. He's a guy that's been sending you all the Zoom links and everything. But I'll, mm. I'll send... Okay, check. Yeah, Karim, Karim Dastagir at nrc.co.uk. Okay, thank okay. you. I'm fairly sure, I'm fairly sure that your organization, NHS, hasn't paid for take two, but I, I don't know. No, that's fine. I just need to find out what I'm doing. Thank you. That's what Jenny's saying the same as me. NHS Wales won't pay for it. There you go. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they are. Okay, any other questions? Now, this is quite annoying, but from January this year, up until January this year, the foundation exams were open-ended. There was no uh, there was no expiry date. Mm -hmm. But from January of this year, guess what? People said change the rules. And they put a timestamp on these. So this is valid now for three years. 
So if you wish to stay on the a successful candidates register and this qualification to remain current, then you, re you need to reset or gain professional points, which you can get, uh, as we'll explain later, after three years. So they've, they've all had a, they all have a three year date stamp now. This has only just been brought in for the foundation exam, to be honest. It's really annoying. Uh, up until December, uh, the foundation exam had no expiry date. OK. So that's the foundation exam. And we will have covered the ground for that by Wednesday afternoon. And in fact, we'll have covered more than that. We'll have caught more than that because from Wednesday after th through Thursday and Friday morning, there is no new content as such. It's really now coaching you for the practitioner exam. And the practitioner exam is still multiple choice, but it's more interpretive. Because what they're now saying is, okay, the foundation exam tests that you know it, but this exam tries to test that you can apply it. Yeah. So let me take you through the objectives of the practitioner exam. So the practitioner exam. So what they try to test with this is that you can apply prints to. This is what it's trying to test. To a project scenario, case study, if you like. and set of circumstances which arise in that project. Okay. So it's all about, can you apply the advice in this big book or in this big PDF? And the idea is if you're applying any kind of, uh, uh, how can I put it? Uh, any kind of um, process, procedure, methodology in real life, you would have access to the manual. And so you do in this book, in this exam, sorry, you're allowed to and expected to use the reference manual at some points. So there's a couple of things here. It isn't anticipated you would use the reference manual for every uh, question. You won't have time. It's very much there as a backstop, a backup. Yeah. Um, also, you have to find things fairly quickly. So, you know, it's, you, you need to get comfortable, if I can explain it, put it that way, with the manual uh, over the next few days and certainly in your evening work. I'll be shouting out as we go through the week, key pages, key sections of the manual, which I believe will be useful to you in the practitioner exam. And I'll be reminding you of these on Thursday as well. And we will be using the practice reference manual on Thursday as well to, 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 to run through a sample paper. I'll be sending you sample papers. We'll be working through them. I'm going to add to your, your documentation. So it's all based on that, which you can use. Now, you can't have anything else. You can't have anything which is outside this manual, but you can personalize it. So whether you have the PDF or whether you have the hard copy, um, you can highlight uh, key pages. Um, you can make notes within it. If you've got the hard copy, there are blank pages where you can make additional notes. So you can personalize it, but you can't have anything which is outside those 404 or whatever it is, pages of that manual. So it's a big book to print, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> but um, that's what you can have, okay? So you need to be, you need to know your way around the manual. And by, by Thursday afternoon, I think you will. So you will be given a project scenario at exam time. It'll only be one, and it'll be no more than, if you had a printed thing, a sheet of A4. And that one scenario covers all the questions, covers all the questions, yeah? Um, 
if you're in a Windows environment, certainly it opens up in a separate window, so you can you can you can minimize it and download it. It's available to you all the way through the exam. Yeah, all the way through the exam. All the questions are based on that one scenario. Here's the first thing: you don't need any specialist knowledge to understand the scenario. It's not going to be heavily financial, heavily IT, heavily HR, you know, heavily engineering. It's something which you you'll be able to get to uh, understand, I think, in about 10 minutes or thereabouts, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, so that is the basis for all the questions. And we will be working through a typical scenario uh, on Thursday. Then you have circumstances to deal with, circumstances which arise in, in, that, in, that, in that scenario. So things happen. You ask questions related to the scenario. But there is no writing. It's still multiple choice. We call it a more complex multiple choice. Now, complex doesn't mean harder. What I mean by it, it's not necessary. Although it's based on fact, it's it's not it's not uh, it's not pure fact, because they'll use words like here is here is a situation which has arisen. Here are some possible solutions to that situation. Which is the most appropriate response according to Prince? Here are some, here are some people who may be involved in the project. Here is some information about key people. Who is the most appropriate individual to be appointed as executive? So the best way to think of it is there's an element of interpretation there. And what we were interpreting, Interpretation, gosh, this morning, yeah. Interpretation. Uh, they're less complex than that, Gareth, to be honest. There are two styles, but then we haven't got those horrible true, false, false, true ones. We took them out of prints too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we took those out. There are two, um, there are actually two styles of questions this time, not four. And of course, I'll be coaching you through all of these. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still multiple choice. Um, there's no writing, there's no essay basis to this, but this interpretation is important. What is the most appropriate thing to do here from the choices you're given? Who's the most appropriate person to take on this, this responsibility and so on? Now, this exam again has, uh, is multiple choice. There are 68 questions, self-contained, 68 questions, which is a strange number. And originally there were 75. And the trial, when they first started trialing these questions, the feedback we gave was that 75, because we were involved in the trials, 75 is too many questions. We suggested that 65 questions would be a reasonable amount uh, for this exam for the average uh, candidate. So the exam board looked at it and said, yeah, we think there are too many questions, but when, you know, and you know what negotiations like, we're not gonna to go to 65, we'll go down to 68. So there are 68 self contest questions. And it's a very structured exam, as you'll see, and I'd rather park this if I can till Thursday, it just follows the structure of the exam, of, of the manual. There is no guesswork. It tells you precisely which topic is being questioned and it follows the structure of the manual. Again, you have to get 55%. So you're looking for 38 out of 68. 38 out of 68. You don't have to pass every topic, um, but you do have to get 38 out of 68. Now, this is, um, this is quite a long exam. For those of, those of you doing it in your first language, it's two hours, 30 minutes two hours, 30 minutes. So it's quite a long exam, this one. Um, again, if you're doing it in the second language and you tell people so that when you sign up for the exams, you get plus 25% in terms of time, which I think is three hours and eight minutes. Okay, so that's more soon. Now we're gonna spend all day Thursday working through um, uh, a, a, a sample paper, a sample exam, so that we can uh, we can get to grips with that. Yeah. And we'll also have a drop-in session if you choose to attend it on Friday morning, 
where I'll give you some last minute, if you like, exam coaching, remind you of things, answer all your final questions and so on. Oh, good. Any questions about the multiple choice? Again, this is a three year exam. It's got a three years date stamp. Um, unless you've opted out, you'll be placed on the successful um, candidates register, um, which, which you drop off after three years. I mean, if that's not important to you, I wouldn't worry about researching the exam. You don't lose the knowledge, do you? Um, but if you, if the, it depends really whether the successful candidates register is uh, of interest to you. Anna. Sorry, one question. Uh, regarding the, when to take that exam, I know it's a personal choice, but what do you recommend? For example, do you think that we are very well prepared after the week to take the exam? Or do you oh. recommend us to uh, do some study and revision and after that and then well, the exam? I, everyone's got a different style. One of the good things about online exams, it, rather than doing it within the course, is you have that breathing space at the end of the exam. Um, I'll be honest, there's a balance between making sure you're prepared and, and, and being too, too, too remote from the course. Most people, if, if I'm honest, do it within the week after the course or maybe the week after. So five to 10 days after in that week, the following. That's when I find most people do it. When I look at when people are, I, I can see when people have scheduled their exams and things I get from people. So generally people try and get them over within either the week following exam, the exam or, or sorry, sorry, my apologies, the week following the course or the week after that. But but some people would rather take longer. But I, I think there's a danger of getting out of the zone, if you see what I mean. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, Anna. Any other questions about how the exams work? Again, so you're, it's very much in your hands to schedule that with, with people at a time to suit you. Do remember, you can change your mind um, if you schedule it, say, for a week on Wednesday and you say, oh, I'm not ready, you can push it back. But you've got to give 48 hours notice. Oh, guess what? They'll charge you. They're really good at making money, people. So, Gareth. Um, I quite enjoyed the format of the Agile where on the Wednesday we did the foundation and then on the um, Thursday we did the prac. Would, would I be at a disadvantage if I, I did the foundation Wednesday night and then the other exam on the Friday? No, not at all. We, we, we don't do it like that on this course because it's a much bigger book. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, it's a much bigger book than Agile. There's more to cover. There's more process involved, to be honest. Um, and of course, we, we are no longer in control of the exams. Up until a year last February, I used to run the exams in much the way I used to for Agile, uh, Gareth. But we they, they, they changed the rules and the... I think they had some corruption issues in some parts of the world. Um, they never actually said that, um, but they changed the rules. So people said run the exams, but certainly by, by Wednesday close of play, we will have covered the ground for foundation. Um, and then we can move into practice. So if you want to get that out of the way, don't let me stop you, but you can make that decision really. But do remember if you book it for that time and then you think, oh, then you know you need to give them 48. You can still change it, but they'll charge you, a, they'll charge you an adjustment fee. We're going to do like a, a mock exam. Um, All day Thursday is working through a practitioner exam. Uh, but have we got a mock foundation type? I've got to send you two. You're going to love it. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll send you. I'm going to be adding to your load, Gareth. I'll, uh, I'll use that as a steer then. So if I do well on those, I'll, I'll, I'll go yeah, for I'll it. I'll send you one tonight and see how you feel. There you go. How about that? Okay, any other questions about the exam so far? No one else comfortable? So I would encourage you, if you haven't had a chance already, to look at that, um, uh, that, that document I sent you about um, exam, uh, taking it online exams for both a Mac environment and a Windows environment. Because, you know, it does tell you, you know, what, what the, 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 the exam supervisor, they call them a proctor, will be looking for in terms of the environment you're in, what you can do, what you can't do. And if you are sitting in a second language, please make sure you make that. There's a box you can you, you can you can do you can you can uh, tick I think on the exam, which will help you to give you extra time, and it just comes automatically. Okay. So um, what have we done? We've talked about the objectives. I've outlined the exams. Obviously, more to come taking you through the timescales and, uh, uh, and the course material. What I'd like to do, um, if I can, is to uh, 
just to get to know everybody. Yeah, that's true, Lisa, but things change. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they, it's weird, isn't it? You can do courses, you, because obviously it's an international organization. You can actually do exams 24-7, 365. So you can do exams at three in the morning. Uh, but yeah, um, y it's worth keeping a look, keep an eye on that um, um, because things do change because people change their minds and so on and so forth. So, So I'd like if we can just to spend, now we've got a big group, so I'll just do some very quick introductions just to find out what knowledge there is in the group if I can, and then we'll grab a cup of coffee before we, we go further forward. So um, this is me. Me, Tony Perks, funny sort of name, what can you do? Uh, from, from Cardiff, from South Wales, started my supposed career. Uh, in the stats office in South Wales, when I thought I was interested in IT, even though I became a member of the British Computer Society and the Computer, British Computer Society examiner and was invited to be a fellow at one point, I realized I wasn't really interested in IT. Uh, I was interested in the business problems it solved. I was the world's worst computer programmer, uh, but I was quite good, if I say so myself, at business analysis and project management. So I got headhunted uh, to become a project management consultant for government. So I moved away to uh, to be based in central London and uh, uh, lived in Surrey for what was meant to be a five year assignment. Um, this was when government seemed to have a bit of money and was promoting project management because we had big budgets and we were free spirits and we would get uh, government department representatives phoned us up and saying we are struggling with our project. Will you come and give us some advice? I understand you run a free consultancy service. And I would say, well, I might, where are you? And they'd say, Edinburgh. And I'd say, whoa, I like Edinburgh. I'll come up in the morning. So I used to fly up and down. And where are you? Oh, yeah, we're in Cardiff. Oh, I'll come and see my mum. So it was quite a nice job for about uh, four or five years. The team I was in, uh, with some external advice, took the forerunner of Prince, which itself was the forerunner of Prince too. Um, we actually developed it from something which was in place at the time called PROMPT, Project Organization Management and Development Techniques. Um, so I was in there right at the forefront. Hopefully that experience will come through. And people started saying, well, we'd like to, uh, we, we, we want to have a badge of recognition. So we, we, we set up the exam. So some of this is my fault. I'm really sorry. Some of this is my fault. Um, I did that for four or five years and they said, you're quite good at this. And I said, right, okay, that's good because I'm not sure I've been very good at anything yet. And they said, in fact, yes, you're quite so good. So we're going to stop you doing it. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we're going to promote you, you can head up the division. And so instead of flying around and traveling around, you have to sit behind a desk in, uh, in central London and all your staff are going to do that. And I said, well, I don't think I'm going to be any good at that. And I'm not sure I want to do it. And they said, well, have a go. It is promotion. So I did it for six weeks and then I resigned uh because i didn't want to do it and i've worked in the private sector for about the last 20 years doing the various things obviously i facilitate training but i also get involved with real projects you know um i help people uh, as a coach um setting up projects i also go to do a lot of firefighting if projects are in trouble um so i, I like to think that i'm actually involved on a day-to-day -day basis i don't just work with prince i don't do ITIL lana but i uh, anything in the change world is my area so program management, agile, agile projects. I'm a scrum master, agile coach. So if that doesn't mean anything to people, don't worry about it. But I do all that kind of stuff. Lucky enough to work internationally. Um, uh, in November, I was in Kazakhstan. Um, I'm due to go to uh, Vilnius. Vilnius again. I do a lot of work in the Baltics. I've never been to Kiev or to Ukraine, Oz, but I've been to quite spent but quite a lot of time in uh, Estonia and in, uh, in in Lithuania and and also in Latvia and Croatia so uh, I'm like I think I've worked in 40 odd countries so again hopefully that experience will come through if you're interested um, about 15 years ago I uh, I've got fed up of living in London my uh, 
uh, my uh, my wife, uh, my kids left me. Not well, not my wife didn't leave me. My kids left me when they've been to university. So my wife and I trekked back to South Wales, which is where I'm again now, where I'm regularly disappointed by Cardiff rugby uh, and Cardiff City. But uh, another story, really. Um, so um, I mentioned Kareem earlier on at NLC. A lot of you have come through Kareem's offices. Um, Kareem runs a company called NILC. They're in fact my training partners. The accredited training company is called Aims for Change, and we work in partnership with Kareem. So that's why I sort of hand over all the financial aspects to Kareem. He deals with all that. He deals with React. He deals PLA schemes, all that kind of stuff, LCAS, all those kind of financial schemes, which frees me up to uh, do horrible things to nice people. So um, that, that's a bit about me. What I'd like to find out if we could, and we've got a big group, and the prize after we've done this, the prize is... Um, that we're going to grab some copy. Um, so what I'd like if you, if we can just we walk through the group, uh, just remind people who you are, what sort of sector you're in, or if you want to, company. And what I'd like to find out is in terms of project management, on a scale of one to five, where, where do you think you fit? I mean, have you played a role, are, you know, have you not played a role? What roles did you play? And if you were going to put yourself between one to one to five, where would you sit on that? Just so I can get a feel for the groups. Also, there will, there is mention in the management manual about agile development, agile ways of working. If that means nothing to you, don't worry about it. But again, some people know things like Kanban, Scrum, and so on. Again, let me know where you fit on that just one to five uh, so that I can find out a little bit about you. I want to keep it short and sweet uh, because we've got a big group and this, you know, we're the best will in the world, this can take over. So I want you to imagine when you're telling everybody this and you can also, you can also revisit the discussion through the breakout rooms in the week. I want you to imagine if you would, you're holding a matchstick. It's meant to be a matchstick and the matchstick burns in 60 seconds. So if you if you talk for more than 60 seconds, you get your fingers burned. Okay, so let's uh, just just a quick introduction before we grab some coffee. I'll just put ourselves on small. So I'll go through my group in my, my in the list. I've got them. Amelia, how are you? Hi everyone, Amelia here. I work for the NHS in South Wales. Um, I've not done much project management, although my a job before the NHS was for the Rutherford Cancer Centres when I was a project administrator. Okay. So I'd know bits, but I'm probably about a one or a two. Okay, thank you. Come across any agile? No. Okay. I did a ride for Jiffy from um, from Cardiff to Swansea uh, a few months ago for, um, for uh, Valindra and Singleton. So uh, yeah, cancer hospitals are very really important, I think. Have a sort and sweet. Thank you, Amelia. Donna, how are you? Good morning. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. How's your, how's your leg? I'm worried about you. <laughs> it's fine. I've got it elevated and compressed and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> my, daughter, my granddaughter plays for Panath All-Stars, so I know about netball injuries. Uh, well, I'm not a netballer. I'm a runner who ah. has returned to netball. Very, yeah. A bad, a bad decision, and yeah, tore my calf. So oh I'm not going to be playing netball anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Back were were you revisiting your youth at that point? Pardon? Were you revisiting earlier years at that point? Yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> always a bad idea, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so my name's Donna Heath. I work for an organisation called Cambrian Training Company. Um, I'm based in Mid Wales, just a little village called Llanfairnian. Um, we deliver work-based learning apprenticeships. Over the last few years, the company's grown quite significantly. So we're funded by the Welsh Government. Um, so there's just lots of projects internally that are starting to take place. My role as business support manager um, within the organisation picks up some of those. So I just like to have a little bit more of a structure okay. when, when doing the projects. But I have no experience with Agile. Um, so very entry level project management at the moment. Think. Is that near Newtown, as I recall? Am I right in thinking it's near uh, Yeah, I had offices just outside Welshpool, so yeah, not far. Oh, okay. 
Thanks, thanks, Don. I hope your legs better. Thank you. Better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tracy, good morning. Oh, Tracy's not speaking to me. Morning, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, right, so my name's Tracy Lewis. Um, I live in Barry, South Wales, um, and I work. Barry Bados, Barry Bados. <laughs> Barry Bados, yes, always sends, send, shines in Barry Bados. Um, I work for, well, recently worked for um, Digital Healthcare Wales, so NHS. Mm -hmm. uh, project management, I'd say maybe about one, one or two. I did, I was involved in some projects, but we're talking about like 25 years ago. Uh, when you were in school? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> and um, a bit of agile, it was Kanban, Six Sigma, all that good okay. stuff. But I say it's so long ago, I can't really remember most of it. All right, that's fine. Thanks for that. Uh, we love Barry. You can't not love Barry, except when it comes to the Barry 10K. You realise how how hilly Barry is. I got to tell you, I'm a bit of a runner as well, Donna. <laughs> so many hills in Barry. Yeah, that, no, don't do any running. No. Good development around good sheds and so on and so forth. Oh, really good. Harriet, good morning. Good morning, all. Hi, I'm Harriet Pennell. I live in Cardiff. Um, and why would I, you I am wearing my Cardiff rugby jacket as well. Why would, you want, why, would you to, why would you want to live anywhere else? You're, exactly. You're a big fan. I am a huge fan. Sale ticket? Got your sale ticket? Yes, yep, season member. I Got like my sale work. ticket. <laughs> um, yep, so I work for Cardiff Council at the moment with uh, Track and Trace. It is still going, believe it or not. Is Started it? there. Okay. <laughs> started there two years ago as a tracer on a three-month contract um and I'm now a senior team lead with them um which means that I can pick up anything and everything project wise so I'm very much learning on the job um mm -hmm. I'm an events manager by trade so I've got a bit of project management experience from that but nothing formalized since we got a lot of information at once on one module on my master's so um, I'm probably around a two on both Okay, cool. So the more important thing is, where are you in the ground? Where's your season ticket? Are you south or north? South, always south. Southwest Terrace. Terrace. Yeah, Terrace. All right. Terrace. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm behind you. I mean, I'm, cause my wife's about four foot six, so we're in the stand. So we're just where the players run out. We're just on the right. So I have to give you a wave sometimes. Yeah, you know, we're usually just there. <laughs> so you must know Big Tony then? Yes, yeah. Well, I'm somewhere, if you look up when you're down there, I'm, I'm behind all those guys there. Were you in Bill Barrow? That's a big question. No, I couldn't get the time off work to go over. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll meet again, and I will promise not to speak about Prince. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually in the city arms before and after. I know exactly where you are. Lovely to meet you. Andrew, good morning. Good morning, Tony. Uh, my name's Andrew Green. I work for NHS Wales on a joining up health and social care project uh, called WCCIS. Interesting earlier to hear you talk about prompt. I did the prompt qualification in 1984. Whoa, what? Probably is uh, longer really ago than any of us care to own up to. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I was late 80s getting into that, but blimey, that's you must have the well, you probably still have the books within the blue folders and all that kind of stuff. Somewhere. I think they got checked out a long time ago, but yeah, I, I did. They they made us do it. I worked for Thorny MI at the time, and we were working on a defence project. So everybody who worked on the you defense project, the yeah. yeah, had to go and do prompt. So that's oh, wow. um, the first person I've met for years that remembers prompt, Andrew. <laughs> I had to go look it up because I did. I I, I remember doing it. I couldn't remember what on earth it was called, uh, but yeah. I, I would say on the on the scales, PM probably two slash three and agile probably two slash three. I've I've done both uh, in many guises in many different engineering and IT projects over the years. Okay. Thank you, my friend. Nice talking to you. Luke, good morning. Morning. Morning, Luke. I loved your out of office, said you were away for Christmas when I first wrote you last week. <laughs> Then, yeah, then you Rookie. changed it, didn't you? You changed it. Rookie mistake. Yeah, I've changed it now. So yeah, <laughs> thankfully somebody picked it up before I went off on leave. So yeah, uh, so I, it did make me laugh. So I got to say. <laughs> Um, Luke Millward, um, working in, at the moment as pro project manager in Command and County Council. I've worked there for about fifteen years. Um, so I think on the scale, I'd probably say I'm about a three. Um, oh. And Agile, I've got an awareness of, but um, I'd be about a one on that. All right, mate. So, Sunny Cabal, then for you, then? That's it. 
today it is anyway. Uh, oh, it's lovely. It's lovely, Cabalden, around there. Mike Phillips kind of area. That's it, yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Luke. Appreciate that. Sorry, being quick. We're going a big group, and you know we can talk more as the week goes. Jenny, how are you doing? I am Jenny. I live in Bridgend. Um, I'm a product support manager in digital healthcare Wales. Um, my main background is in finance. Um, I'd say I'm project manager role. I'm about a tool and agile about a tool. Brilliant. I got good friends on Broadlands. Anyone near you? I live in the valleys. I do. Ah, <laughs> uh, right. Oh, you just you, you travel in. I always think of Bridgend as a land time forgot because it's halfway between Cardiff and Swansea, isn't it, really? You know what I mean? Yeah, and the valleys are even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Surely not, Jenny. Come on. Gareth, how good to see you again, my friend. Yeah, great to see you. I uh, finished the Agile course and thought I'd better get the Prince one as well. So thank you very much. You're welcome. We have yeah. Um, so Gareth Morgan, I work in life science, engineering, biotech. Uh, my predominant roles are basically to make stuff happen. Uh, for a long time, I just sort of did what was common sense with no real structure um, and recognized the need to get sort of agile and project management qualifications to get those tick boxes done. Um, so I'd say a three and a three. Um, and that's about it. All right, mate. Nice to see you again. Thanks for sticking with it. Yes, thanks. I, your name. I thought, oh, we'll have, to, we'll have a lively week with Gareth again, to be honest. Yeah. I must admit. Helen, how are you doing? Pax. Hi, um, I'm Helen, Helen O'Connor. I stay in Glasgow. Um, I'm a project manager with WTW, so finance or pensions based. Um, I've been a project manager there for just over a year. And prior to that, my background is change. So business analyst, business change, again, always in finance. Um, probably um, number three, maybe mm -hmm. keeping up to four project management scale, agile scale, only know it in theory because I did a software development degree. So literally just studied it, but never had an opportunity to put it into practice. Cool. So do you work with John Boxall and uh, Monica Woodcher? I have absolutely no idea who these people are. I think oh, okay. I know John Boxall. I might have seen his name on an email, but yeah, Monica, yeah. I don't know who that is. Same company, I sold. It's, it's absolutely huge though and I've never I've never physically met anyone in my company so yeah I stay in Glasgow but I'm associated with an office in Surrey and most of my team are in Manila and Mumbai so oh, I've, I've never met anyone in the time I've worked there. I love Glasgow, I've got some, I've got some good friends in the posh West End you know so they ask where. Well that's where I stay yeah the West End's the best bit. Uh, so do you know the ubiquitous trip then for? Yes it's lovely absolutely beautiful yeah. <laughs> yeah good there. Uh, thanks, Helen. Um, Francesca, good morning. Oh, we haven't got Francesca. You're on mute. Hello. Oh, you're on mute. Hello. Hi, yeah. Sorry. No worries. So I, I'm Francesca. I'm a, a product marketing manager. So I work for um, a company called Vital Pet Group. We're a national wholesaler. Um, so I've worked with them for the last uh, 13 years in August. So a long time within the business. Um, but yeah, from a project management perspective, it's all been things that we've created in-house. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing necessarily structured as such. Um, and we've just made changes as and when we've needed to, if you like. So yeah, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a one on the project management and a one on the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, just, 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 just do it is a good way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, cool. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, Thank Courtney, Have we got Courtney. Mm. I can't see a name there. All right. That's a bit confusing. All right, not to worry. Um, James, good morning, James. Uh, morning. Hi, I'm James Truman. Um, I work for Nyren Bowen University Health Board. Uh, been here for 18 years. Um, I have been involved in a number of different projects, but I wouldn't say I've applied any learning. It's been a case of um, I understand what is needed to be done and, and just get it done, really. Yeah. Um, so probably a one and yeah, no experience of Agile either. OK, don't worry about that. Thanks a lot, uh, James. Appreciate Thank that. You. Uh, I know this is fast, but it's um, you're all working forward to caffeine now. I can tell before we do something really hard. Catherine, good morning. Morning. 
Um, I'm Catherine. I work in HR um, in the public sector and I don't really have any um, real experience. I'd rate myself as a one on both. Okie dokie. Thank you very much. But, you know, people often think these project managing, but uh, restructuring um, um, our, um, our projects too. Uh, for HR, you know, recruitment drives and so on. And we often get that coming up as an exam thing. So good thing to be there. Lisa. Hi, uh, I'm Lisa. Um, I live near Bridgend as well in Pencoid. Um, oh, Gareth Henson country. And yeah. Alfie. And Alfie. Yeah, we've got some good boys come out of... Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm uh, part of NHS Wales, so Public Health Wales, and I work in the same um, team as, as Anna and Anthony on the call. Um, I'm, um, I've done Agile. I did that about just over a year ago um, when I was part of the Wales, Wales Cancer Network. Do you mind me, when you say I've done Agile, do you mind me asking you, was it Scrum or is it Agile PM? Or do you mind Agile me? PM. Agile yeah. PM, all right, yeah, we can talk to Gareth then. So yeah, it was um, about it was November twenty one, so um, probably a year ago. Um, but since doing that, I joined the um, the uh, the team that I work with uh, Anna and, and Anthony at the moment. Um, I've not used project management skills within that role as such, but I'm due to move over to the National Pathology Program as a project manager in um, mid Feb. So looking forward to sort of revitalizing my skills and uh, and taking Prince practices across with me. Brilliant. So, so like midway on both those scales. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Appreciate it. Oh, I've put you up higher than that if you've done Agile PM. I'll put you up higher than that. You're being, you're being modest. Everyone's modest when we do this. Anna, good morning. <clears throat> morning. <clears throat> Anna Maldonado. I work in the NHS Digital Health and Care Wells. Uh, I work in projects, so I will say uh, around three, uh, and I did the Prince 2 Foundation back in 2017. So I'm doing this again just to get the practitioner, but I, I, I think I will benefit from a refresher. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, luckily I will be using the, the extra 25% in time. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. And Agile, I will say theory too, but practice not much. Okay. You think about the foundation up until December, I was able to say you don't really need to do it again, but because they brought in um, this, they're, 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 um, they're, 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 they're retrofitting the three year date. So your foundation certificate will run out now, which never did before, which is all wrong. We really hate it. So, and is there any, any issues with a failing imaging uh, foundation and not able to pass the practitioner? Is there any? Uh, it's quite interesting. You, you, although, if you want to be on the register, they won't put you on the register for but until you pass both, you know, uh, for, for a successful candidate register for a practitioner. But you often get people who, um, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about Andrew here, but are, are, are more mature and have a lot of experience, but, uh, you know, and so they're very good at practitioner, but maybe their memory isn't as bright, as, as strong for the foundation. So people like, like I'm not saying Andrew, but people of the more mature variety often don't do so well in foundation, but do really well in practitioner. And then you get a lot of people who perhaps, should we say slightly younger, and maybe are used to doing exams. Maybe they've, um, you know, they've just come out of university. They're really good at exams and memory but they haven't got the practical experience. So, you know, if you if you were unsuccessful in foundation, it doesn't stop you doing practitioner. They just hold your result in, as a pending result until it's all sorted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that then, Anna. Claire. Hello. Um, Hi, Claire. I'm Claire Latham. I, um, I'm from Flintshire in North Wales and I work for um, Digital Healthcare Wales. I've recently joined there as a, business analyst um, and I would say probably I give myself a two on the project management experience and then one on agile you know very little about agile. That, that doesn't sound like a North Walian accent though if you don't want me saying so clear. <laughs> probably just not very Welsh I'm very close to the border. Ah uh, you're on the border okay fair enough you've got that Michael Owen thing going on there yeah. Very much he lives down the road. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, I see. Anthony good morning. Hello, um, my name's Anthony. I split my time between being a clinical scientist in um, one of the hospitals in South Wales 
uh, and also working on the uh, same program as uh, Lisa and Anna. Um, so in terms of uh, project management, I have had very little formal training, either Prince or, or Agile. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, Priyanka, am I right there? Hi, yeah, that's correct. Um, hello, I'm Priyanka. I am an electrical engineer by trade. Um, I also do a bit of lighting design and project management for the construction industry. Oh, right. um, I've got, I guess, I'm on two on project management, um, no experience on agile, but looking to upskill and move permanently into project management. Thank you very much. Oles, hello, hello. Hello, hello. My name is Oles Rupinski. I'm from Ukraine. Um, I work as a, a chief of legal in BKT company. Um, I have a relevant education in IT, in computer engineering, but I never work in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm always, I was always close to IT industry because I work with IT companies in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I made project in uh, in a, in a field and edge between legal uh, finance and IT, uh, but there are no formal uh, knowledge in Prince too in this methodology because it's not common in Ukraine. And uh, I can say that pro as a project manager, maybe it's three, but as a Prince too, it's zero because I have no idea what is this and how it works. And with Agile, I was cl working close with agile teams, but not in agile methodology because I'm a legal uh, specialist. Okay. That's why I had zero in, in that case. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Oles. Legal project management is quite a big deal now. Um, I've worked with quite a few legal guys in uh, solicitors in the UK and also with a financial firm in uh, Riga called Mintos. And uh, I think, you know, legal matter is quite an interesting thing to try to put a boundary around to try and control with pricing, particularly. Glenis. Hey, where's Glenis? Hello. Hi. 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 So, Claire, we're in the same area here. Uh, right. I'm from North Wales. So I'm, I'm in Denbyshire, North Wales. This is the proper North Wales accent that you can hear. I can hear. I, can hear. I, I heard it on Friday. I thought, oh, that's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lovely accent in Cardiff. It's like I when I talk proper, like you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're more sophisticated up north. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make you a Wrexham fan? Oh, wasn't the football fantastic last night? Oh my goodness! Oh, they were so unlucky as well. Very so unlucky, but amazing game. What a game! Yeah. Anyway, back to business. I work for um, local authority in social services, and. Um, my, I'm, yes, I, I have projects that I, I look at, but to be honest, I want to home in on appropriate qualification for it. So my experience of Prince, I'd say is three and right. Agile, I haven't done any Agile at all, to be honest. Okay. I'm aware of it, but I, ha I, have, I haven't used it at all. Okay. Thanks very much. And finally, last but definitely not least, Mark. I, uh, yeah, I'm impressed that you got you came to us on Saturday. I turned my my phone on this morning. I went, well, we got somebody else. Yeah, very last minute came through in the end. Uh, yeah, I work for a company in uh, Swansea called uh, 3M. Um, it's a manufacturing plant. Um, yeah, more so in the engineering department where I've been for 23 years. Um, I've had a little bit of experience in like equipment installs and light installs. So on the project side, I might say. Got a little bit of knowledge on two and agile uh, zero or one. Okay, so that makes you a Swans fan then. Yes, yes. <laughs> very, very much so. Friend, my very good friend Keith Bamsey from Bagland is a big Swans fan. I, I I've decided not to talk about football to any Swansea for the time being. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, That's fine. That's the Jack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think everyone's at everyone's at. Well, we 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 talked to everybody there. Is that right? Oh, and now you see, are you Courtney? No, I'm Elena. Hi. Yeah. Why have I got you? To, sorry, my apologies, Elena. Yes. That's my, okay. 
I, sorry, I'm, I'm, my, my apologies. It's my fault. I've got a. That's okay. Mistake. Is my name not showing? Uh, no, it's it's my fault. It's I, I I've transferred information from one page to another, and foolishly I missed you off, and I have no idea why, and I'm very sorry. That's okay. You just don't like me. It's fine. <laughs> I'm joking. So my name is Elena Nutu. Um, I've lived in Cardiff for the last nine years. Um, currently in Romania, visiting my visiting my friends and family. So. Um, yeah, I've worked in insurance mainly. Uh, in the last five years, I've worked in project delivery. So uh, just delivering IT projects, insurance products in an agile way. Mm -hmm. um, so I've worked as a product tester in electronic data interchange. So although I have some knowledge experience of project management, agile delivering methods, I would say I'm one or two. So I've, I've, I have the on, the, on the job learning, but I didn't, actually get the courses or the foundations to start with so i'm trying to do a bit of a reverse engineering now <laughs> uh you don't have to tell me but was that admiral uh axa axa insurance AXA, AXA. oh yeah i've worked with that yeah. quite a lot but in bristol by uh really yeah yeah in the in the in the, room, the big building with the street by the mod's abbey wood place so, yeah, i worked there quite a lot with that i've never been there but yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. and i think that's courtney there co 51902 would that be right Hi, Tony. Yes, that's me. Sorry, I've been having really bad um, internet problems this morning. My laptop died on me first thing, so I couldn't get on. So I had to go into work to get another laptop oh, no, until I could join me. on. So sorry, I'm a bit late. Not to worry. I know that um, Kareem told me you were having problems. So, uh, uh, but yeah. Anyway, good that you're here. Um, all we're doing is quick introductions. I'll make sure you don't miss anything we've covered before that. Don't worry. Okay. So. Um, can you see what's on my screen? Let me make it bigger. Just tell us a little bit about yourself very quickly, if you could. Um, here we go, make myself big. Ba, ba, ba. Yeah. So just a bit about you, what company or sector you're from. Uh, where do you fit in that scale on each of those? Um, yeah, so um, my name's Courtney. I'm a business change manager working in um, an Iron Bevan health board um, yeah. I work in the informatics team so um, I'm very much aligned with um, project managers in the informatics team so one to five what what does that mean sorry well if you're rating your your knowledge or experience of project management or agile between hardly anything and, and really know it um I'd probably say about four for project management then same for agile i guess brilliant you can run the course for me courtney if that's all oh, right i don't know about that <laughs> brilliant. i take it back <laughs> fantastic uh thanks and i'm really sorry that uh, elena I, I miss you out that's about that's poor form for me um so no trouble at all we, we've now got to uh, you, you know we're going to do breakout rooms and we get to know each other a bit more but thank you for that i know everyone hates doing that um i've got a really hard thing for you to do now um, which is going to need your and it, so I'm, I need you to take. I think you need caffeine, don't you? Anyone ever agree? Caffeine's a good point. Um, we always drive things by time, sort of agile approach, really. Um, so um, can I suggest we, we we meet again at eleven? So it just gives you just over fifteen minutes. Grab caffeine, whatever other drugs you need to help you through the day. Uh, that's fine, and we'll uh, we'll see you at eleven o'clock. Ready to uh, get into some get into some prints too. See you at 11, guys. Thank you very much for your time there. Thank you. Very prompt, Tony. Oh, perfect. I'm a pretty, you're a prince amongst men there, uh, Andrew. <laughs> Go prompt, eh? Project organization, management and planning techniques. Yeah, it was a bit of a, a, a three ring circus, to be honest. I don't think anybody quite got their head around it when we did it, but it was made up for us via the MOD. One really entertaining thing about that, though, was I did get to sit at a big meeting table with Michael Hesseltine, who was defence minister. At the oh, time. Right, yeah. And he did swear and F and B, which really shocked me. I was really surprised. I didn't think cabinet minister did that sort of stuff. 
Whereas nowadays, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely, yeah. You can see why you grab the mace and try to hit people with it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, MOD were big into prompt in time, but it was all very rigid. It needed sorted out really. So uh, we, we, first we, we were working. We were working on a really weird project, which was um, to build the timers for the cluster bombs. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. I've only got the project by default because three of the other project managers that they were given given to said, "No, oh, we don't want to work with that. It's awful." <laughs> Keep away from that, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it it's a bit of a bit of a horrible weapon, to be absolutely honest. There's so much of it's banned now. I think. Was it? Yeah. Interesting time, Mark. You you should have had an email now from people, sir. I dropped you an email just now. You've had one this morning now, which gives you your voucher and all that. Just like I'll check. Know. I'll check now. Yeah, ah. don't worry. Okay, so I think we got everyone back in. So thanks for the introductions. As I say, normally we spend a you know in, with a smaller group we spend a bit more time talking about and learning more about people because we only ever get interesting people on my courses. But with such a big group, it can take on uh, too long. And I'm really sorry, Elena. I feel really bad that I discarded you, thrown on the scrap heap in the first morning. That doesn't seem right, does it really? No offence, honestly. <laughs> you, well, you're welcome to take offence if you like. I always nah. say to people, and Gareth will know this, you're allowed to be twice as cheeky to me as I am for you. Oh, I'll take you on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Way back. So I'm going to I'm gonna ask you to join breakout rooms in a moment. I don't know if anyone's uh, been on you use Zoom before. It's a very simple process. What will happen is I'll allocate you uh, into uh, into small groups of about five people. Um, and you'll be asked to join the room. Um, then then you can you can see each other, you can discuss what we're going to do. I generally leave you to um, I used to use the word fester, but that's probably not the right word to 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 think about things and to chat for a few minutes. And then I'll come and join you and like a I'll come into your room like a bad smell um, and see how you're getting on. I'll jump in and out during the rooms. And then at the end of a time, or maybe if I close them early, you'll be asked to rejoin the main room. So you're in control of that. So um, you'll be asked to join the room and then you'll be told the room is closing, come back into the main room. Okay. I don't record um, um, what, what goes on in the breakout rooms. So you can be as scurrilous as you like, to be honest. Um, and the idea of this one now is I wonder if I could um, get you thinking about uh, the idea of a project. Um, you know, because um, I think over the last five or 10 years, maybe a bit longer than that, I guess, people have started to to adopt project management more. On, on, and I, I worry sometimes whether people realize what a project is. I know it sounds silly, but I, I did some work for a large um, mobile phone provider not too long ago. And when I rocked up on day one, the, uh, the senior leader there said to me, you're going to like it here. And I said, well, that's good. It's always nice to work in places where, where, you're going to be, where I'm going to like it. And he said, because we treat everything as a project. And I said, you're bonkers, which is not a great way to start an assignment, really. Uh, and he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you, you're set up to provide a functional service here, an ongoing operational service. If you try to uh, dump project management ideas and particularly documentation on that, uh, well, welcome to uh, the world of bureaucracy and so everything's slowing down. So I think we really need to think about what characterizes a project as opposed to business as usual. And also um, uh, think about what we need to establish at the front of a project to get it going, so to speak. So I thought I'd ask you about this. I, I wonder if I could think you five things which differentiate, if I could use that word, project from, can I use this expression? This is okay with everyone? Business as usual, normal business, business operations. And also, if you can, five things that we need to establish Put in place, if you like, at the outset. So if you think of more than five things, just prioritize. 
in the time that we've got, just five things which which you think differentiate a project from business as usual, just a list of those, and five things that we need to put in place at the outset. Is, is that okay with everyone? Um, so I'll ask you to join the rooms just shortly. Uh, as I say, I'll leave you for a while to uh, uh, to think about it, and then we'll, uh, we'll I'll come and join you. Here you go. Tony, I'll try and keep my questions to a minimum this uh, this time round. <laughs> I, I got to say, I do remember. I think you did ask more questions than anyone else I've ever had, but that's fine. I just, that's fine. I just enjoyed it so much. It was uh, it was it was great. Cool. I'm glad. This is a bit more um, bit more bit more bit more sort of detail in terms of process and that. But yeah, I can answer all your questions. I read the book last night. I think I got the hang of it. Honest. <laughs> but yeah, no, we'll try and do it. If, and if I can't control it in the day, we can we can stay on after if you like, Gareth. No problem. Always happy to help. Yeah. Just make sure we got everyone in. Harriet's sort of leap in and out. I'm not sure where she is. She's. Can you um? Can you tailor prints to that? Like, like. Oh, very you know, much. So. I'm going to sound like Owen Evans now. Very much so. I mean, the idea of it is, it's it's not rules. It's guidance. You know, it's. In fact, you know, this chapter four is all about tailoring, you know, well, how do I use it? You know, so the idea is you if it's a small and simple project, you scale it back. Um, if it's a commercial project, then you think about contractual issues. If it's a larger project, then you need more formality. You know, if it's part of a bigger program and so on, then you need to that. If you're using an agile approach, then you might do some different things. And if you're doing so, it's it's broad guidance to work within. And a lot of the manual is, a, is about tailoring, about how you use it. And it's and I think it's really important. And you'll see that one of our one of our principles uh, is that um, we should tailor to the project environment. That's one of our principles, uh, which are in chapter three. So if you're not tailoring it, arguably, you're not using prints. And it's a big problem. I think people sort of dump Prince too, and say we're going to do Prince now, and they lose the part. They lose the fact, the point that it's not an end in itself. It's a means of getting there. You know. So my but, my my worry. Know, the... Don't do digging. They grow plants. Digging is a device which helps them grow plants. You know, it's the same kind of thing. I was going to say my worry from the front end is that you don't want to, like. I get the need for it and all that kind of stuff, but it's it's tailoring in such a way that you actually do the work and it's not just all um all yeah. all process. But yeah. It, but too many people think Taylor is leaving out the tricky bits. It can become a bit master slave if you're not too careful. Yeah, I agree. Um, and and it's um, it, 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 in many areas, like I'll be honest with you, in the agile world, it's a bit of a toxic word. You know, mm -hmm. because people implement it very, um, very, very, very formally, you know, and, and lose sight of the fact that it's a tool to help you get there. And in fact, you know, Prince2 is not, a, is not a waterfall methodology. You can use it in all sorts of environments. You just got to think about it. And that's one of the very first things we do, as you'll see, when we set up the project initiating, is think about the kind of project we're working on and how we can best tailor prints in that environment. I wonder if anybody's ever got waterfall to work correctly for a big complex project. I never have. <laughs> Every project's got an element of increment and iteration in it, hasn't it, really? It always has. Had. It's the change that always does you. See all these all these arguments on on Prince too about waterfall against um, agile. It, it's all load of all nonsense, really. You know, John Lennon had it right. He said, "Whatever gets you through the night, that's what you use." You know, how do I run this project? Whatever we need for this particular project, and that's that's the thing people lose sight of. Mm -hmm. People get very sort of hide boundaries. Oh, you know, we're we're, we're going to be agile, or we're going to use Prince too. You know, what are we trying to achieve? What's the best way of getting there? And how can we apply what, what you know, the best practices to get us there? Oh, again, very philosophical now on Monday morning, are we? Right. I need something. I need the most wonderful of things now. A volunteer from each group. If I could, someone can be bold enough to tell me from group, from, uh, from room one, which five things which differentiate a project from a normal business. Can someone be bold enough to uh, pick up the cudgel from room, room one? I can't remember what room we were in, Tony. Oh, let me see where we were now. Break up rooms. Room one um, had Donna. Oh, it had you in it, Gareth. There we are. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's me or uh, Elena, who could probably do this. So, <laughs> Oh, nothing like being volunteered, Elena. Yeah, thank you very much, Gareth. It's very kind of you. 
<laughs> I can do the first I thought five. you were the leader. I can. I've heard of collaborative practices, but I mean, blimey. We are very, very highly collaborative. Yeah. If you'll do the first one, I'll do the second one. Although I haven't noted them down. I thought you okay, were doing I, that. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll call I'll, in the power. Come on, Gareth. Um, business case led. We, we, we got we got quite a few. Business case led. There's a continued business justification, i.e. the product can, the project can be aborted. Yeah. Um, you can't abort the business as usual. Uh, yeah. It's usually temporary. There's a time limit. Yeah. There's some sort of measurable outcome or product at the end of it. Um, we've got, uh, it usually brings together a few specialist skills. Can I, uh, can I use the words cross-functional for that? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, stakeholder consideration wants a need. So there's usually someone up the top that needs, or a few people. Um, but there should be some requirements. Project board. Yeah. yeah. Requirements. Okay. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sure you've got a million. Room two. Who's room two? Claire and Glennis and Lisa and Luke and Ola and Tracy. If you've got the same ones, just don't worry about it. Just shout them out. Someone? Claire, Glennis, Lisa? Sorry, I was trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't hovering. Um, yeah, we had some of those maybe terms slightly differently. So, yeah, we put down something new, which is like the requirements. Okay. Let me just write that down. So you're bringing about something new or something different? Yeah, we put down about structure as well, so that it needs to be in a particular structure. Yeah. Um, we noted down different stakeholders, which could fall under the special different specialities. Yeah. And that a project needs uh, works to time constraints as yeah. opposed to business and use as usual. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Wow. Thank you very much. I know you've got many more than five, just to, just to see if, if we got it. Um, the room three has got Andrew, Catherine, COO 51902, which is also Courtney and Jenny in it. Yeah, we came up with that is temporary, so there's a limited life on it. Yeah, so we've got that it's one. A change. Yeah, bringing about something, it's a change, isn't it, really? We've got change managers in the group, haven't we? Introduce we up to we get new deliverables to deliver a new benefit. Oh, I like that. Benefits. Deliverables lead to benefits, I think you said there, didn't you? Yeah, we said that there's uncertainty and the not knowing, so you don't know about any risks or... Yeah, so there's always risk in bringing about change, isn't there? And then we said that every project is unique in the way it's run and timescales, etc. Yeah. Each one is a one-off, isn't it? Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for Room 3. And can we have the results from the room four jury? It's like the Eurovision Song Contest now, isn't it? Can we have someone from um, Amelia, Anna, Anthony, all eight, Harriet and Mark? Oh, well, I wrote it down. So, um, yeah, we like everybody's um, got time constraints, you've got time scales. And, um, yeah. Um, we need to find goals. Um, it's temporary. So so it's goals or objectives, yeah. Temporary. Um, we have goals are, in Cardiff. We, Cardiff don't score goals, do they? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use yeah. objectives, otherwise I start crying. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And you set a, a specific uh, cross-functional team, which again, I suppose, is temporary. Yeah. So we've got a team in there, which is the temporary team. Good point. Yeah. Uh, it's an introduction of change, and uh, there's there's more risk associated with projects than because uh, you're bringing about change. You can't plan with 100 percent certainty. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, thank you for that. So I think we've got a lot of them anyway, but let's see if we can now. Th so we know what a project is. It's bringing about change. It's a temporary endeavor. I quite like what Gareth said. You can abort the project, but you can't abort business as usual. We bring, we, we produce some kind of deliverable. I think you were talking about quality of your group, temporary team of all the skills. We need to get to grips with what's wanted, mainly by the project board. Um, we're bringing about something new or change. We've got to engage with the stakeholders. There is a, a proper structure to it. The deliverables should lead to benefits. Everyone's a one-off. We should have some objectives. Uh, and we can't plan with 100% certainty, so we've got risk. When you say structure, did you mean a plan, by the way, as well? I don't know. Okay, so what about, and I think we may, there may be a crossover here. What about the things that we need to put in place um, right at the very beginning? 
Can we go back to group one? Which is the uh, Donna, Elena um, group, if we could. Yeah. I think it's going to be in place if we get in. There may be some crossover to what you came up with, don't I? I'm going to pass. I'll send Elena a message now with the stuff. Send her an email, Gareth. That's always the best way to communicate. Hang on. Why don't you enter an email address? I've done. No, you notice I don't share those, Elena, because you get because Gareth will be stalking you. Otherwise, I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. Um, right. So let's have a quick look. Um, outset considerations. We said we needed to have a project plan. We need a plan. Yep. Cool. We need to assign the responsibilities. Yeah, responsibilities. Yeah, establish the success criteria. Oh, yeah, we like that. Uh, establish what the risks are. Yeah. Mm. Or risk management, maybe. Yeah. Um, have a time and cost um, awareness, I suppose. Time frame. The budget and the timeline, yeah. Yeah, and we also included tolerance. Yeah, I know you're not like sure saying. if that fits in here, but yeah, well, the bigger the better. <laughs> we come on to that. That's a big deal, actually. We're going to come on to that now. Thank you very much. Room, room, room two. Thank you. Which is Claire and um, and Tracy and Oles and Luke and Lisa. Yeah, um, we wrote down, I think, some of those. We put um, justification and business requirement. So there needs to Need be justification and kind of case. Yeah. Uh, the scope. We need to set the scope. Yeah. What your baseline is. Current as-is as is position. People don't forget about that, don't they? Yeah. Um, budget and resource, which I think is already on there. What resources you've got. We've got people resources here. So roles, resources and so on there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and time scale was the last put the air timeline. Cool, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, room three, have you got anything different to that? Maybe if we sort of highlight those. That's Andrew through to Jenny. No, we had similar, we had about the resources in terms of people, we had risk management, we had the business justification, funding from like a host organisation, yeah, the funding. Those objectives and the benefits, and then we said about having like the chain of command, so who's in control of what. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, so that would be in terms of roles and responsibilities, clear structure for the, for the project. Yeah, brilliant. And last but definitely not least, Mark, Harriet, Anthony, Anna, and Amelia. Have you got any different ones to those? Well, you've got most of them so far, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, go on, sorry, no, I do. Okay. The only other one we noted down was um, about change, the impacts that it would have, um, and potentially the lessons to be learned from the project. So, oh, yes, yeah, so that's a good one, lessons learned. Maybe we should keep that, shouldn't we, from previous projects, and we should learn as we go. And the impact of change on our scope, yeah, I think most projects suffer from what I call CYJs. Have you come across CYJs? Okay, comes, I bet you have. I bet you have come across CYJs. Creeping of? Eh? Creeping of? No, well, you're working on a project, you're working to a contract, you're working to a spec, whatever you call it, and either your boss or your client phones you up and says, I know I didn't ask you originally. I know it wasn't in the original scope, but... Yeah. Can you guess it? Can you guess it? Can you just? Can you just? Can you just, can you just? There's so much work coming to your company. If you could just do this for us, if you could just add this on, and nobody gives you more time and more money. And most companies who lose, most most companies that lose money often in a in a project management situation often lose money on CY just CYJs because the project manager is trying to be nice to the clients and all that kind of stuff, and then you you, you just keep drifting through it. You know, scope group. So thanks for that. You obviously, you know, the annoying thing about um, all these things is you have to think about them at the beginning of a project, don't you? When really you just, you know, you, you're already under pressure, I would say. You should have started the project three weeks, three months ago. And there's an element of someone, you know, senior leader saying, just get on with it, just get on with it, just do it, just do it. Whereas if we don't set it up right, and my view is, I don't know whether you agree with me, that most projects could go wrong, go wrong at the beginning, because people don't think about when we're going to do things, who's going to do what, uh, what if the world ends tomorrow, how much are we going to spend, how long are we going to take, and so on. And we have to think about those things at the beginning. And obviously a key thing 
is um is putting in place a plan. When you think, I don't know whether you agree with me again, you don't have to. Um, when you think about projects and project management, we do tend to think about plans and planning. And to be honest, too many people think about sitting in a dark room to producing a, a Gantt chart or a bar chart, which isn't really what we would call planning, as you'll see tomorrow. But would you agree with me, and you don't have to, that every project needs a plan? Definitely. I think so. It's, I mean, I'm going to be a bit X factor now. A, a project is like a journey, isn't it? You're starting here and you need to get over there, you know, and you need to know, you know, how you're going to get there, when you're going to get there, who's going to be driving, who's going to be helping, when you're going to stop off on way. So we do need a plan, don't we? Um, and you'd be quite surprised, I suspect, how many, um, how many projects don't have a plan. Okay. I worked with a financial company in Dorking in Surrey some years ago. I did a lot of work with them. And uh, I, uh, I was asked to help them get something going um, and also asked to do some fighting, quite a bit of firefighting for them. And, um, you know, I was asked to look at one particular project. And uh, I, I rocked up there and said, okay, let's start off by looking at the plan. And the project manager said to me, we don't have one. I said, you don't have a plan? She said, no, we don't have a plan for our project. I said, all projects need a plan. She said, no, we, the, the methodology we use doesn't demand a plan. I said, sorry? She said, the methodology we use on this, in this organization has, doesn't, doesn't demand that you produce a plan. Oh, I said, right, okay. okay. I'm, I'm pretty well versed in project management. You know, I can talk about PRINCE2, I can talk about Agile, I can talk about uh, project Management Institute, Body of Knowledge, Association of Project Management. I know some of the ideas coming out of Toyota and Spotify. They all need a plan. She said, ours doesn't. I said, well, have you developed this methodology yourself? She said, no, no, no. We, we, we took it from Nike. I said, you took it from Nike? She said, Nike have got a project management methodology. I said, well, I, I said, I'm learning something now. This is, you know, every day is a school day sort of thing. You know, this is the first I've heard of, an, of Nike having a project management method. Should they do? Should it's on every one of their adverts. It's on every one of their adverts. Yeah, just do it. Here it be yeah. me, sorry. If, I'm not, if I'm honest, and I don't know you well enough to be rude yet, she put another letter in there, <laughs> uh, which I think was flipping. Flipping do it. Flipping do it. I'm sure it wasn't. Um, and, you know, I'm like, well, <laughs> And you see that, or I've seen that quite often on many on small projects, I've got to say. But on large projects, you often see the opposite of that. I don't know whether you agree with me on this, but people often over plan, you know, and people spend weeks and weeks and weeks putting in place really serious um, spreadsheets and uh, bar charts, Gantt charts, and all that kind of stuff, um, in, in the, in, in, and, and stick it up on the wall and think they're planning. And again, I've got a good example of this. This was a couple of years before the pandemic, but um, um, one, one UK government department um, seemed to be spending a lot of money with a particular management consultancy. So this management consultancy was taking a lot of fees out of this government department. So Treasury, HM Treasury got a bit nervous about it and they decided that what they needed to do was to do a sort of audit of all their projects to see that the taxpayer was getting value for money. So I was only a small cog in this, I just a small cog. I, I can't say I did much there, but it was just a small cog. And I was asked to look at one project, which was fairly significant. There was a lot of outsourced resources in it. So I rocked up on site, as you do, and I was greeted by a very senior civil servant. He was the same grade as I was when I left, so grade five, which is relatively senior. And he, he, when, when, we, when we opened up for the meeting, his opening remark to me, I always remember this, was, you will not catch us out. All right. So I thought, well, there's a man on the back foot. There's a man who's very defensive. Um, so so I, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, and this is not, in, not, not normally in my nature, I lied. I said, well, I'm not trying to catch you out. Well, I wasn't, but I think I probably am now. We're just trying to see if taxpayers get value for money. And he said, well, I think you will find that we apply project management procedures rigorously and robustly. And people say, well, you must be pleased about that. You're a project management person. And the answer is, no, I'm not. Because what that means is they've done what we just discussed, what Andrew was saying earlier on. They just dumped project management on without thought to tailoring how best to use it and so on and so forth. Yeah, and it becomes a box ticking exercise. You know, all, it has to be tailored. It has to be used in an appropriate way. You know, it's a means to an end rather than the end in itself. So I said, oh, right, okay. I said, well, can we start by looking at the plan? And he said, we take planning very seriously. And I said, I thought you might. 
And he said something like, and you have to forgive me now, it's been a few years. He said something like, we've had a team of five people spent the last eight weeks planning. I went, what? Five people, eight weeks? He said, yeah. I said, that's a huge overhead. And he said, well, you've got to do it properly, haven't you? And I said, well, show me. And he said, well, we'll go down, we've got a project management office and we'll go down there and it, there's a wall chart and everything is on the wall chart. So we went down to the project management office and on the wall for probably, as I recall, about three meters was what looked to me like an electrical wiring diagram. Yeah? Um, or a sewage system, you know, overview. And I, there were a lot, if I use the words critical path analysis, some of you may have come across that. So boxes and lines and color coding, beautifully drawn, absolutely beautifully drawn. And it communicated zero, zilch, nothing, because it was overly complicated. So I said, that's amazing. And he went, oh, right, we're, we're, we're very proud of it. And I went, that's not quite what I meant. So I had to find some, some sort of, you know, obviously I had to sort of find some point of reference in this because that was what I was there for. I don't know what's going on here. And I looked across, I looked in this, uh, I looked in this book, um, in this plan, and there was a box with lines coming in and things going out. Um, and it was about five foot into this sun. <laughs> That's the only measure I could find, about five foot into this, into this plan. And it said something like, we will review, I can again, forgive me, we will review document 99 or whatever in room B75. And the actual date of this meeting for which the room had been booked was four months downstream. And they'd actually set a start time for the meeting of half past two. And they planned the whole project in half day uh, detail, granularity as a project management board. Now, you know, unless you, uh, you know, to be honest, you know, unless you've got a significant event in your life, like you've pre planned a holiday or a wedding or something like that, nobody knows what they're going to do at 2 30 in four months time in a project, nobody knows. And they, that's why they're taking them so long to do this plan, because it, uh, it you know, they, they'd over planned it. So I, I said to this guy, so where are we today then? And he said, oh, hang on, let me just check my chart. He said, oh, we're in week 17 or whatever. He said, there's a scale along the bottom. So I said, okay, so that's today. He said, yeah, week 17. Well, I'll be honest, that's telling me nothing other than that's today's date. You know, that is the 30th of January. It's not telling me anything about how much money has been burnt, how much has been delivered for the time and so on. It's just today's date. So, all right, okay. So I said, okay, so if I drew a line up here on your plan, absolute look of horror on his face. He said, don't do that, you'll spoil the plan. Okay, so here's a man not amenable to change, yeah? So I said, what if I did a pretending one, an invisible one, a logical line, only you and I will know it's there. And he said, well, why would you do that? Well, I said, if that's today, that's obviously the past. So what you'll have done is base your plan on estimates, but of course you'll be collecting actuals and learning lessons, and you'll be adjusting your plan for the, for the remainder of the project based on, on actual information. He said, we don't do that. I said, you don't do that? I said, why not? He said, well, to be honest, we took so long to do the plan. We haven't really got a chance to put it up to date and in time to keep it up to date. So I said, what was the point of the plan? And he said, well, you've got to have a plan. I said, I know you've got to have a plan, but why? What, what was the value of it? And he said, well, to be honest, it served its purpose. I said, explain. He said, well, in order to get funding for our project, yeah, we talk about funding, we have to go to a, to a, a finance committee. And they need to see a plan in detail from, otherwise they won't give us the funding. So we produced the plan specifically for that objective. I said, and, and, and he said, and they liked it. They rubber stamped it. They gave us the money. I said, and now, he said, and now we're just doing it. And people say that can't be true, but it, I promise you it is true. They spent so much, and I see it all the time. I, if I'm honest, I've got to be careful because of who we're with, large UK, large, Public sector organizations tend to work like that. Often when you have grant funded projects and you've got to put a plan together and so on, and you spend too much time planning, and not enough time getting on with it. So underpinning just about everything in prints, to be honest, is that our approach to producing a plan, which is outlined in chapter nine of the manual. But I just want to take you through it informally here and see if you think it makes sense. Because we know all projects need a plan, 
but we have a particular approach to producing a plan, which I'm going to call the rolling wave approach. And we don't try to plan everything in detail from the very beginning. And, and this is essential, really, to the way prints work. So if I can just get this over, and you know, if I get you to do something else. So what we say from the beginning, you need to put a project plan in place, which takes us from the start to the end of the project, but in very much high level. Okay, so we need a project plan and it will be based on estimates. An estimated expenditure, so a budget or a cost, if you like, and a timeline. And the expenditure curve is usually a cumulative estimate. So this, this is our estimate. And if we have previous experience to learn on, maybe we did previous uh, projects of a similar nature, then that will help us. But what we also say is there is no point trying to plan it to the nth degree of detail all the way through. So we will break our project plan up into sequential management stages. Now, there are no predetermined, predetermined, predefined stages in Prince 2. You look, need to look at every project in its own right. And what we will do, we will only plan the first stage in detail. So we will just put this up here. We will just plan the first stage in detail. No, no more than that. We'll make, we'll make provision for the rest of the project. And then what happens as we get toward the end of the stage, we do what you might call a retrospective, which is a look back and a look forward. In Prince terms, it's called a stage boundary. And what we do at this point is really a reality check, reality check, estimate against that. How well did we do against our estimates in this stage? And then we'll use the lessons that we learn to plan the next stage. So at the end of every stage, we produce some form of end of stage report. Doesn't have to be that formal, but we need to reflect on the current stage. And we produce the next stage plan in detail. And this requires endorsement by our project board. And if they give us the go ahead, we move to the next stage. So we can now start that stage. And at the end of that stage, we do another reality check. And the lessons we've learned from that enable us to plan the next stage and so on. The, the formal term for this is called hierarchic and iterative planning. Much better to call it rolling wave because it means that you actually spend less time planning. You're still in control. You've still got the overall picture, big picture, but you, you're more time getting on with it and adjusting your plan, flexing your plan to reflect reality. So we always split our project down into sequential management stages. And each stage, each project has to be looked at in its own right. And people often say, we can't do that. We need to, we need to allocate resources down here. Well, you can allocate resources. You can book resources. People, you don't, you, you don't pretend you know exactly what someone's going to do in seven or eight months time, but it's bonkers. And it, and it really does work. And it, it kind of underpins everything that we do in prints. It's chapter nine of the manual, which we're going to cover tomorrow afternoon. But it, it's, it's really there. And, 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 it, and it just works. So, so let me give you an example. I'm going to keep away from IT. It's too easy to do IT examples and so on. Uh, but just imagine if you will. Uh, you're watching Wrexham against Sheffield United last evening. Yeah. Wow, that was exciting, wasn't it? Mate? And your other half comes in and they made you a cup of coffee. And, 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 and he or she sits down and, you, and they say, oh, this room's a bit scruffy, isn't it? Sorry, this room, you know, this room, do you think we should think about maybe refurbishing this room, decorate this room? Well, we could do, I suppose, you know, we haven't been on holiday for a while, we've got a bit of money, so, you know, could do, yeah, we could, okay, let's, let's agree we could refurbish this room. And, and you say, yeah, but I don't do it myself. 
I'm, I'm, I'm really busy working for the NHS, working for Carmarthen, working for, uh, for Conwy. I, I don't do it myself. So, okay. Well, we won't DIY then. We'll GSI. Does anyone GSI rather than DIY? GSI? Get someone in? All right. So you decide to get someone outsourcing it, yeah? And everyone knows when you outsource any piece of work, it goes swimmingly, doesn't it? Yeah. So, uh, so in keeping with good procurement practice, supplier selection, you decide to phone three reputable traders and try and get a price. So the first guy comes along and he, you say, can you give me a price for decorating a room? And he's, he quickly looks around. He says, oh, there's not much work here. So, right, is, is a job too small for you or something? No, 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 I, it's, I, I want the job. I want the work. But um, he said, I've got a reputation for working quick and cheap. Sounds like my kind of guy. So what do you reckon then? He says, you're going to pay cash? Yeah. 300 pounds. All in, 300 pounds. How long will it take you? I could do this in two days. Two days. It's quite a big room. No, no, I've done loads of room, many rooms like this for two days. In two days, two days, 300 pounds. I said, right. Well, that's, I thought, it, oh, yeah, well, that's a good that's a good price. He said, oh, yeah. And he said, but I can't give you the work because I've got some other people giving me a price, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be back in touch. Yeah, all right, give me a ring on my mobile. People like that are always on their mobile. You never know where they really live, yeah? Uh, <laughs> and then a second guy comes in. He said, can you give me a, can you give me a price for, um, uh, for decorating this room? And uh, he said, okay. He said, do you want a proper job? I said, yeah, of course I want a proper job. I want, want a good job. So, okay, well, give me 10 minutes. And he starts wandering around the room, trying the light switches and knocking on the walls and looking at the floor and he's scratching his head. And you say, you okay? He said, yeah, I think it, there's a lot of work here. A lot of work, a lot of work. What, what, what do you reckon then? He said, I think we're talking three or four weeks, three or four weeks. And your price would be, well, I think you're in for at least 2000 pounds. So, well, thank you very much. And he goes away. And, and you think to yourself, this is crazy. This is crazy. I've got one guy saying, two days, 300 pounds, one guy saying three or four weeks, 2,000 two pounds. Which one's right? And the answer is neither, because they're too extreme. But the big problem is, you haven't really put, going back to what you came up with, a scope around the project. Because the guy that said two days might be thinking well, his idea of decorating the room is putting, just painting the walls with some emulsion. Whereas a guy that said three or four weeks, may well be thinking um, we need to change the furniture, we need to change the electrics, we need to change the carpet. And so until you define your output, what you're looking to get from this, you know, what, what, what you're trying to achieve, then how you're not comparing like with like. So a third guy comes in, third guy comes in, and you say, can you give me a price for decorating the room? And he says, not really. And you say, well, that's not very helpful because that's why I've asked you to come. He said, but I will be able to once we've done some business analysis. And you say, I saw your lips move, but I have no idea what you just said. What on earth is business analysis? He said, oh, right. Sorry about that. Sorry about the jargon. All that means is um, I need to ask you questions as a potential supplier and you are my potential customer about what you mean by this room as a product or, out, or output, call it what you will, really print calls and outputs. What you, what you mean by this product and what sort of quality you look for. And once I've done that, I will be able to give you a price. And you say, all right, if that's business analysis, I understand. And then he says, right, for example, the, the furniture that's currently in the room, do you want that replaced, changed, or are you happy just to put it back into the room? No, the furniture's fine, as are the electrics. Right, so they're out of scope. What about the walls? Do you want them painted or do you want some wall covering, some wallpaper? Well, I was thinking of some wallpaper, really, to make it a bit, okay, yeah. Um, what about the, the, the floor? Now, at the moment, we've got carpet. Are you happy with um, carpet? Well, I was thinking of wood block flooring. It's a bit more modern, a bit cleaner. We'll have wood, yeah, okay, we'll wood block flooring. So these are all things that you want. What about the, the skirting boards? Oh, we want those painted. Okay, so you want painted skirting boards. And there you go. So the, the conversation goes on until you say, okay, that's it. You've understood what I want, what the outputs I want you to create. 
And then he says, okay, so have we got any time constraints? Because to be honest, to be in a, to a reasonable time frame for doing what you want is it's going to take seven days. So if you were intending to use this room in under seven days, then I wouldn't start now. I would schedule it for another time. No, I can live, I can live without the room for seven days. So, okay, here's a tricky question. What's your budget? Because to do what you want in the time that you want, and I think we're talking about a thousand pounds. So if you haven't got a thousand pounds, then we have to be more realistic, because obviously there's no point starting a project with unrealistic objectives. And you say, no, no, that's fine. He says, okay, well, um, now that we've established what you want me to create, what you want me to produce, I will put a team together to produce that within your seven day time frame and within your budget of 1,000 pounds. And, and you think to yourself, I kind of like this guy. Um, he, he's definitely not the cheapest or the quickest, but did that guy that say two, di two days, 300 pounds, really understand what I wanted? I mean, there may have been problems en route because this guy has taken a professional approach to understanding the scope, the time frame, and, and the cost. And I, I think that's a good thing to do right at the beginning. And he's put in place what I'm going to call quite a lot this week, the project manager's triangle, in that understanding the scope and the associated quality with it, you know, how, how, what kind of quality of wood flooring and wallpaper, understood the time constraints and the cost constraints. And you say to him, well, I, I'll be honest with you, you're not the... Uh, you're not the cheapest or the quickest, but I think you've you've taken. I think you really got to grips with what I want here, and I've got confidence in your approach. So I'm going to give you the job. He says, "Fantastic." And you say, "So when can your people start?" And he says, "Well, they can come on site on Wednesday." You say, "Fantastic." Now I'll be in works. So what I was going to do is leave the keys with my neighbour, and perhaps they could just crack on on a daily basis. So wait, no, you can't just do that. Well. Can I just hand it over to you completely? Is this, no, no, no. We have to work more as a, you're the customer. And I'm, you know, we have to look more in partnership. There may be things to happen, you know, that we have to discuss en route. It's okay. So well, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to treat it as a project. It's okay. He said, now, um, in, in any project, we break it up into, into sequential stages. Now, every project is different, but looking at this one, the first stage is going to be clearing out the room as it is. Then I'll do, or my team will do floor of wall preparation. Then we will decorate to install what you want. And then we will refit the furniture and so on that we took out. So sounds good, sounds good. We've got some structure. He said, now I'm only really gonna plan the first stage in detail. She said, right. She says, now I think this will take two days and I can give precise instruction to a team of two people, a two gang team, to tell them what they got, what they need to do. Say, so, okay. Because now, <clears throat> what will happen as we get towards the end of those two days, I'll do a kind of retrospective on what's happened in the current stage. And at that point, I'll be able to plan the next stage in detail. So, okay. He said, so if we could have a meeting in the kitchen, uh, in the cafe down the road, I'll tell you what's happened thus far, and that could be a payment point in a large contract. And I'll now, so you should feel now comfortable that I'm on the right track here, my people are doing the right job. And that point will we'll, um, produce the next stage plan. And um, if you're happy with that, we'll progress to the next stage. That's great. I love the communication with me as a primary stakeholder. And he says, um, oh, oh, by the way, you might need to make some decisions at these points. Well, why would I need to make some decisions as a customer? Surely we've made all the decisions up front. <clears throat> and he said, well, the thing is about projects is we can't plan with 100% certainty. There may well be interim decisions to be made as we go through. And, and you said, well, can you give me an example? He says, sure. He says, you want the existing carpet replaced with woodblock flooring? Yeah. He said, he said, so I've made an allowance for what, based on my initial estimate, of what preparation we'd have to do. But when my guys lift up the carpet, it's only at that point we will find out if the floor underneath is solid. You know, there may well be some work to be done. There may be damp there. There may be new tiling needed. There may be re-screening needed. So, you know, if that's the case, 
then that would be additional work over and above uh, what that which we planned for, which we'd have to do. He said, so what we might need to do is to say, well, if you want to stick to the, uh, um, the original budget, we might need more time to do it. Now, you as a customer might say, no, you can't. We've, we've committed to using this room on day eight. You can't have more time. Right. Okay, well, we can overcome that by putting a third person into the team. But of course, that will increase the costs. You as a customer might say you can't do that either. We've only got 1,000K. You've got to live within that. Cost and time don't shift. So right. Okay. So we can stick to time by putting a third person into the job. And we can stick to cost or budget by perhaps using slightly cheaper materials. But you're in charge of that decision making because you're the customer. You're paying for it. So we can make adjustments. We can flex the plan as we go. Does that kind of make sense? Customers make, because they're paying for it. And you tell me, what would you do? What would you do if you had a person in your, in your house working on your property, working on a job on your property? What would you do? I'm not going to stereotype anyone here. What, what would you do the minute the white van leaves your property at four o'clock in the afternoon? Be honest, what would you do? Check what they've done. Absolutely. Review is a nicer word. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you go, well, he's blinking gone early again, isn't he? I, uh, and he's, I'm not being stereotyping, but I bet he's drunk eight cups of coffee with nine sugars in each one in a big sports direct mug, probably left the toilet seat up. I'm going to go in and check it. And you would, wouldn't you? And you'd go in there and you'd say, well, he hasn't made much progress today. I'm going to have to have a word tomorrow. I might even have to have a word with his boss. And um, um, I don't like the way he's done that. I think he's made a mess of that. I'm going to have to have a word. Yeah. Because you wouldn't wait to the end, is what I'm saying. Because these are what we would call controls. Controls are set up at the beginning and run all the way through the project of two things, really. Progress and quality. And that should be running all the way through. So can I ask you, does that way of working make sense to everybody? Can it seem to make sense? Just seems sensible to me. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest with you, combination of working in this way and of advice in these other areas is, is Prince too. So um, thanks for coming. It went a bit quicker than I thought, to be honest. They just take 400, point, 400 pages to say so. And that's really it. You know, and if it, 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 it's really important, I, I come to you now, Gareth. It's really important that if um, uh, if I say anything this week that doesn't feel like common sense, you should challenge it because it's only common sense. And people say, "Oh, yeah, but that's a seven-day project. Our projects are six months, nine months." So yeah, okay, we'll just scale it up. It's just a amount of formality and so on and so forth. Yeah, but that's the idea. Is at the beginning we establish all these things. We, we put a plan in for the overall project, struck a, broken up into stages. We control each stage at a time. And at the end of stage, we all go, oh, blimey. And alongside all that, we're going forward. Gareth, how can I help you? Um, just, just comparison to Agile. So with Prince, you're allowed pending stakeholder approval, et cetera, to well, increase cost. If you link it to Agile, these are increments, aren't they? A stage is an increment with a retrospective at the end. Uh, yeah, but my, my question is, with Agile, the only thing that could really change was scope, right? Cost and time were fixed. With print, can you um, tweak the cost yes. of time? All the parameters, yes. That's, a, that's one of the major differences. In Agile PM, you drive by time. Yeah. And in, in there is no threshold. There's no tolerance on time and budget. There is in, there is in print too. But you can decide not to give that tolerance. We'll, we'll come on to it. But yeah, the answer, that's, that's a big difference. Now, a couple of things before we leave this slide, if we can, or this flip. Um, I do think that most things go wrong, go wrong at the beginning, because people don't want to set it up properly. Setting up the project is important. You know, if you had someone working on a contract in your house, you would set a contract in place. The other thing I find with the problem with senior leaders, you won't have this in yours, but they can't read the word estimate. They think it means quotation. And an estimate is only as good as your best knowledge. And if we learn from if we're learning from experience on route, we should be challenging estimates and being prepared to re-estimate. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, I see this too often. 
you know, this is what I call the project manager's triangle. This diagram's getting good now. Um, but there needs to be some flexibility on at least one of those parameters. Uh, otherwise, there's no flexibility. There's nothing left to manage. I often call it the meatloaf principle of management because one of the things meatloaf famously said was two out of three ain't bad. You know, and if you are fixed on time and cost, you often have to be realistic about what you can achieve. If you have got a fixed scope, which you often do with legislation, um, with, with um, construction projects and so on, then often time and cost or and or cost can expand. But we set the parameters up front and we kind of juggle, juggle them as we go through. And that's basically the argument. Now I've got something else for you to do now. It's going to be, um, um, it's going to be quite difficult, this next exercise, because you've got no experience of it. Can I offer you a quick break before we do it? Yeah, can we meet again, shall we say at 12.15? Really hard exercise. Make sure your brains are switched on. Okay, welcome back, welcome back. So this is um, just one short, sharp exercise before we break for lunch. So uh, thanks for sticking with me so far. Trying to get some basic ideas over uh, this morning. Uh, another breakout. Now this is gonna be a really hard exercise because you'll have no experience of this. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, but I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Um, because I want you to imagine, if you will, in the group, so I'm going to put you in now, um, that um, you're, 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 you're at the very beginning of a project and you've just met your colleagues in the project management team for the first time. For the first time. And you're not sure you like the look of them, really. You know, there's a few dodgy characters, aren't there, really? But you know, you're all bright eyed and keen to be a success and so on. So what you decide might be a useful thing was just to make a list. A list of 10 things you could do in managing this project to try to make sure that your project is going to be a success. And, and someone, I think it was Harriet, to be honest, she looks fairly subversive to me, like she likes to break all the rules, bit of a disruptor. I think it was Harriet says, what a boring blinking exercise tone, and it is. And I try not to be too boring, given what we do. She says, why don't we turn it around? Why don't we turn it around and try and list 10 things we could do to make it not a success? In other words, 10 things you could do to screw it up. Now, the reason this is hard is I know none of you have any experience of failure. Um, you've only ever worked in successful organizations on successful initiatives. So all I wondered if I could get you to do in the groups I'm going to put you through, it'll be a very short exercise, 10 ways of screwing up a project. Okay. Now, obviously, you could do nothing at all, but I'd rather you would be more positive, like set ridiculous timescales, pull a plug on resources, all those kind of things, really. So just 10 ways of screwing it up. I'm only going to allow 10 minutes for this. Just if you can come up with a list of 10, and let's see where that takes us, okay, as, we leave, as we're leading towards lunch. So I don't need to make it excess. I want you to make it, I want you to try and screw it up from a management perspective. Let's see how we go with this. Let me recreate the rooms. Okay, here we go. Um, change the rooms around quite a bit, I think. Let's see what happens there. Ooh, James in there first. Elena, you were second. James just beat you. <laughs> Always second. Oh, not oh, bad. No way. That's <laughs> a good number to be, I think. James was in like was in like speed of lightning getting back to us. Eh? <laughs> Faster broadband. <laughs> That's all I'll say. 
Yeah, Gareth but, slowed up there. James James was the winner that time. I was going to say I got beaten, did I? Yeah, well, you were well done, mate. I mean, Elena was just close. She was close to James's heels. Um, <laughs> and I think, and then I think it was Glennis. Then I think you were slipping up, mate. Slip it up. No controls in place. Priyanka was. You, did you like the first people you were with? Did you want to go into another group or something? Is that what was happening, Priyanka? It crashed. <laughs> I know. I know. Ah, uh, we got everyone. All oh, right, thanks everyone. Just short, sharp back. So we're almost at lunch. So bear with me. Um, see where this is going to take us now. Um, let me just make myself big. Um, I. I didn't hear in the time I was with it, with your groups, but I, I may have missed it. But did anyone, any group, ask themselves what is a successful project? Um, yeah, you talk, we talked about critical success factors in one of the earlier exercises there. But I don't know. People often think about the end of the project. I don't know. I think it's that. Uh, well, I mean, we won't know anything about this, will we, Harriet? But. Um, when a rugby team loses, you know, you usually get a coach goes on. We don't know about this in Cardiff, obviously. Um, but uh, the coach goes on television, Dai Young, and says, well, we turned the corner. We can learn lessons. We're getting better. It's nonsense, isn't it? You lost again, didn't you? you know? <laughs> yeah. we, just, we just slagged off previous employers and project managers. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Well, a bit like Steve Phillips did on the, on the, on the other day. Uh, yeah, but I mean... You have to think about your saying, well, I mean, what is a successful project? And the, the honest answer is, we'll come on to it, but people have different perceptions. Because if you talk to a project manager, she or he would probably refer back to the triangle I mentioned earlier and say, well, look, it's fairly obvious what is success from my perspective. I delivered everything you asked for. I delivered the agreed scope to meet your requirements. Everything has been properly tested. So it's to the right quality. So the building has a health and safety um, um, certificate. Um, the website doesn't hang if you try to navigate from screen three to screen five. We can correctly calculate um, PAYE. Um, whatever criteria we've got, we've tested it. We came in on time and we came in on budget or cost. Um, oh, and I handled anything which came unexpectedly my way en route. Because to be honest, as, as the project manager, that, that's my role. That's my responsibility to deliver what you might call outputs to, to my customer. And, and, and you can see this in various ways. Um, for example, you know, I, I design and develop training courses for quite a lot of the big commercial companies and they'll get in touch with me, usually their sales staff, and say, we, we believe there's a niche in the market for a, I don't know, agile, agile program management, scrum master, product owner course, Prince2 variant, um, because we want to have, we want to put it on our website. So can you build the training course to us? Can you get it accredited to the appropriate standards? Here's the time scale we want you to work to, and here's how much we'll pay you. And I, when I accept the work, I go, okay. So I develop the training course, I develop the, um, the presentation files, usually there's a case study. Um, I get it signed off by the accredited panel, all, all digital, and I send it back to my client and I expect to be paid. But they don't really want my course. What they want is the revenues arising from it, it's like, and Gareth may remember my friend Simon from a previous course. I've got, I've got, I've got a, a friend Simon who is just only the one friend. You don't, I don't have many friends um, for the obvious reason. Um, he's just retired, but for many years, my friend Simon has spoilt, despoiled our country with orange boxes. Basically, he's found motorway junctions and retail parks all around the UK, and dumped an orange box there, really big orange box, massive orange box. And just before he finishes his project, he hangs a sign outside which says B&Q. B&Q is do-it-yourself superstores. And if you've been in one B&Q, you've been in all of them. Because you know where the tills are, you know where the garden centre is, you know where the builder's yard is. And basically, he, he gives the keys to a store manager and says, okay, 
you should be able to sell bathroom units, kitchen units, lawn permanent mowers, bedding plants and so on. And he walks away because he's done. And you know what? If that sales manager doesn't hit his sales targets, it's not my friend's problem because he was asked to build the B&Q. But again, Kingfisher PLC that own B&Q, they're not so wedded to the color orange that they want orange boxes somewhere. You know, their thought process is much more strategic, is it not? They do some research and they say, if we put a big orange box at Clan Samlet, or if we put a big orange box in Kafartha Park or at Cardiff Gate, we should be able to realize revenues of 250,000 a month. It's like my clients. They don't say, let's, let, let's get Tony to build loads of training courses and see what happens in terms of revenue. Their thought, their thinking is much more strategic. We've done some research. We believe there is a niche in the market. And if we ask Tony to build this course, we should be able to attract 15 people a month to it. Therefore, we'll be asking uh, Tony to build to, um, uh, to, to build a training course. So we are, what, what we should be thinking about is much more about the measurable improvements we expect to realize from the change. And I know that I can see the change managers all nudging, nudging saving because these are called benefits. Okay, benefits are the measurable, keyword measurable, improvements arising from change. So the measurable improvements in business performance expected to arise from the change. And this should be our starting point because what, what this is really about is putting the right outcomes in place. And this should be our starting point. Instead of saying, let's build things and hope we get some, finance, some, some improvement, we should be saying, what improvements are we looking to achieve? And therefore, what outputs do we need? But this is not the role of the project manager. The project manager can't be held responsible for the sale. I mean, if nobody books onto the training course once I've delivered it to my client, other than my ego being a bit bruised, it's not my problem. I, I, you asked me to build a training course. Once again, my friend Simon, if nobody, you know, if the sales man, if the, the store manager doesn't sell the, the expected number of lawn mowers and kitchen units, not his problem, really. He was asked to build an orange box. But somebody needs to be thinking more strategically, more focused on the benefits. And that's a role that we call in Prince 2, the executive. And many people would call this guy the business, this person the business sponsor, because there needs to be just one of these people and also one project manager. I often feel they're like Batman and Robin. And, and the executive, watch out for this in the foundation questions, is the ultimately accountable individual. She or he is going to be held to account for achieving, well, return on investment and making sure the project is at the outset and remains through its life value for money, return on investment, value for money. And this is really the, the, the ultimately accountable individual, the sponsor, the customer, whatever you want. And so the starting point should be here. And, you know, that's why, and you, you came up with this this morning, all projects need to have some form of business justification. Which is generally generally documented as some form of business case. And accountability for the business case is with the executive. She or he is the ultimately accountable individual. And, and to be honest, you know, a very simplistic way of thinking of this I know is this is the gain we expect to get from going through the pain of running the project. I know it's a simple way of thinking of it, but you know, we need to understand right from the outset what expected improvements we expect to make. Now, they don't have to be financial. They could be, for example, you know, it's very easy to say a 10% increase in sales, 100K per month reduction in operating costs, but they could be things which are softer, like reducing the number of children on the at-risk register by 500, um, reducing hospital waiting times from eight weeks to six weeks, providing there's a measure, and that's the key word you need to look for measurable improvements, that's important. 
And if the gain, expected gain doesn't outweigh the pain, why would you start the project? I mean, nobody's going to put £100,000 into an initiative to only give £50,000 worth of payback. It would be daft. It would be daft. But what we also have to remember is that, you know, no, at the beginning of a project, nobody really knows how many people are going to book onto my courses. Nobody really knows how many lawnmowers B&Q will sell in a particular store. It's all based on an estimate. So surely what we have to do is to make sure there's a continued justification. And one of the reasons for breaking down a project into stages is it gives us an opportunity to review whether we should carry on with the project or not. And I think as one group said this morning, if we find that you know, the return on investment isn't likely to come, that the costs are spiraling, market conditions are changed, this is a good point at which we can close the project down early. And sometimes it's a bold move, but sometimes it has to be done. Yeah. So this is, means that we should be more sort of benefit and outcome focused rather than outcome focused. And not enough companies are. Gareth? Have you ever worked with sort of research and development where um, sort of the outcome would be, it's, it's like, you know, we want to do, make this new thing and throughout the project, it becomes apparent that they can't do it or something comes up and they just go, right, close the project down. Or... Yeah. I haven't actually not R and D projects bring their research and development projects bring their own their own um, amusements really, but I've certainly worked on 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 IT software developments when the for example a, 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 another company has beaten them to it and they just pull the plug and walk away from it. It's a bold move sometimes, but you know otherwise you throw bad money after good or whatever. But here's the thing: let me just explain. If you take a traditional project, so let's say building a B and Q or something, and the project starts here. goes through various midpoint stages and closes here. And my, 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 my client, my, my friend's projects close when he gives the keys to a store manager. At what point in that life cycle does he, do you get your benefits in a traditional project? Where do the benefits arise? What do you reckon? The end. At the end, or, yeah, beyond the end, doesn't it really? When my friend Simon, Gives the keys to a store manager. They haven't really got any um, any any sales. All they've got is a big orange box. It's like when I deliver my training course to my to my clients, you know, for them to sell. They haven't got any sales. They have just got my material, and that's the nature of a traditional project. That you know you have a you have a release if you like an implementation at the end. So surely anything which you can do to get early return on investment early return on investment, early return on investment would be a good thing, would it not? Because, you know, what you're adopting there, and it goes back to what Andrew's saying, there's no such thing as a waterfall project, is an incremental delivery. And you see it all the time in the construction industry, do you not? Um, forgive me for only knowing about Cardiff, but I think it's happening all over the place. At the moment, Cardiff is a building site. <laughs> Everywhere you go in Cardiff, there's just houses they look like Sylvanian families to me, but if you've got North Cardiff up Transition Road, houses, new housing estates cropping up everywhere. But you know, you imagine if you're Red Row or Persimmon or Charles Church or whatever, uh, Wilson Homes or whatever, if you've got planning permission for 2,000 houses, you uh, you don't build all 2,000 and say, right, right, people, we better start selling these because you're going to go quickly bust, aren't you? What they do is they release them in blocks which we could call stages, or you could call an increment if you're using agile terminology. And the idea is the revenues which arise from that block then starts to contribute to the sales of the next block and the next block and the next block. And if those revenues don't come in, <coughs> you know, if we're saying, well, you know, we'd anticipated that much sales, we're really getting that much, then you could do some more market research, can you not? And you could say, well, the problem was we built, it looks, from talking to our stakeholders, talking to our customer base, we're building too many three-bedroom homes. We should be building two-bedroom starter homes. So maybe we can adjust our plan as we go and go forward. So a successful project is one which actually achieves the benefits expected to arise from the change. And anything we can do, if we can, and you can't always arrange it as such, 
to get early benefit realization is a good thing. And it's what Andrew is not in Sagey, what we've always called an incremental or phased approach. It's the basis for agile development now and agile delivery. So before we come up with what you what you what you come up with in terms of how you screw up a project, I think we'll take some lunch. So I think we'll stop there if we can. Um, can I suggest we meet again at 1.30? And we'll 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 consolidate your lists of screw ups. I know there's difficult exercise, so I don't want to over, over, overstress you on that. But if we could meet at 1:30, does that work for everybody? And we'll delve yeah. into a bit more detail this afternoon. I'll just make you aware of that. Yeah, yes. we're going to delve into some detail. So keep asking questions. Thanks for asking questions. Don't be don't be shy of asking questions. The more the better. Um, and um, uh, enjoy your lunch. And I'll see you at 1:30 if I can. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back from outer space. <clears throat>
Yeah, so planning issues, right? We've got that one. <laughs> Book means you both got it. Doesn't mean right or wrong. It means you both got it. Never say a no to the customer. Oh, is that is that, is that up here? <laughs> Being afraid to say no. Yeah. Okay, I think those two go together. Yep. Um, avoiding all communication. Oh, absolutely. Um, having a high turnover of staff. Oh, in the team. I think that's a good one, that one. So can I put, um, yeah, let me just write something up here. Uh, team team turnover. Yeah. So again, it gets linked to resources, but it's a different one. I can't spell turnover. What's the matter with you? Turnover, sorry. Not having a business justification and not having it viable. Uh, no business justification. Or not keeping it. Yeah, thank you. Having the wrong team for people who are not actually skilled for the particular roles. Can I put that up here with that one then? Skills as well, is that okay? And then um, not having any quality check-in. Very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. We've got Pavot in the room there. I don't know what's going on, but there we are. Uh, <laughs> room three, which was Catherine, um, um, Courtney, Elena, and James. Can somebody be bold for me? Covered a lot of these ones, I think. No project plan, uh, over planning. Okay, planning, yeah, cool. Uh, assigning roles to the wrong people. So can I put roles and yeah. wrong people? There we are, cool. Just right. uh, not outlining the benefits and w whether it could be a, a success. Benefits, yeah. Uh, micromanaging. Oh, I like that one. Hang on, let me write that one down. That's a good one. Micromanaging. Thank you. Uh, not having a realistic, clear scope. Scoping. We haven't got that. It's having a clear scope. Um, not reviewing the project, so therefore not adapting. So no reviews, no control points. Can I use that word? Yeah, what? no control measures. We had that, yeah. Yeah. Um, not managing the risk, uh, quality assurance. We've got risk here somewhere, I can't see. Oh, here we go. Yeah, quality, um, quality criteria and assurance. Yeah, okay, put that on the um, yeah. And not escalating issues outside of tolerance. Oh, I love that word tolerance, don't we? Um, so can I just put issue management for now? We'll pick yeah, up. of course. Issue man, yeah, I love it. Link to risk management, really. Isn't it? So if they materialise, they become issues. Yeah, cool. Is that it? Oh. Yeah, the last one I think we had was probably not having like the delegating authority in place. So that's probably down to micromanaging. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. And the last room, but last but not least, it's got Tracy in it, it's got Glennis in it, it's got Gareth and Claire. Someone who's not me. Someone shout out. Shout out to my ex. I'll shout out. Next, yeah? That's my granddaughter, <laughs> not me, I promise you. Um, we had um, difficult personalities. Okay, so could I go back to team dynamics for that? Yeah, yes. and also um, toxic environment was uh, one of that as well. Oh, is this, is this getting a bit personal now? Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, moving the goalposts. Oh, right, moving goalposts. I like that to, yeah, so, you know, Moving the goalposts, yeah. That's um, kind of bad. Okay, yeah, go yeah, unrealistic time scales. I think we've had that. Yeah, unrealistic. So can I put that as a yeah. there? That's all unrealistic. We'll have it done by tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, lack of comms. That was lack on there. Of, surely not. Everyone gets that, don't they? Lack of comms. Yeah. Um, overloading certain team members. Oh, right. Um, so so resource allocation there, really. Yeah. It's the resourcing in terms of that. Okay, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, ignoring risks. Ignoring risks. Yeah. Um, got writing too much down. Uh, oh, too much documentation. Mm. So I put documentation, but that could go either way, couldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Either too much or not enough. I've yeah. got negative change. Negative change. Oh, what do you mean by that? Do you want me to ask? I can't remember. What, Gareth, what do you mean by that? Uh, it was uh, like a negative change management approach. Someone comes in and says, oh, yes. This is how we're doing it. it. Doesn't take any feedback off any yeah. of the team. That kind of, no, no empowerment. Yeah, yeah. So it's like micromanaging in a way, but linked to that, just driving through change regardless, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was it. Yeah. So um, let me let me just link that to that because that's just. I think I'm going to just put telling people. Yeah. 
telling not to engage you. Yeah, any more? Making um, assumptions from previous projects was another one. All right. So and using those pro assumptions. Poor assumptions. Yeah. You always challenge assumptions, don't you? Is that it? An unrealistic yeah. stakeholder. Engagement again, is that one? Yeah. Gareth, this is yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, blimey. Now look. Have we got them all there? I think just right. now. Listen, I, I'm, I'm. Uh, this, this, that exercise went very badly, to be honest, um, <laughs> because I don't know what's happened over lunch. Um, because I asked you to work in separate groups, and I think what's happened here, I think over lunch you set up one big WhatsApp group for everybody, because admittedly not always, but you've got a lot, a lot of commonality, have we not? Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a lot of common features, which, which have come across the four groups not not always but look we've got several about planning and resourcing and funding several about the team about quality and so on. and the honest answer is that always happens you know if i do this i can i can pretty much guarantee if if we were in a classroom we would put four boards up and i can pretty much guarantee that you get eight out of ten commonality across the group eight out of ten will be common maybe not the same wording i understand that but eight out of ten commonality and, 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 and it doesn't matter whether it's an open group like this one or a closed group and so on, you know, and the honest answer, you know what, we know how to screw up a project. Now, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not suggesting you do it deliberately, but we know these things happen, don't we? We know people ignore risks or, or, or try to pretend they're not there. We know communication can be difficult. We know that we don't um, engage with the stakeholders, that we do poor planning and resourcing, and that people are not sure who's doing what and that we don't always measure our benefits because you know that's what happens in real projects and and so the answer is why do we keep making those why do we keep making those mistakes and the answer is because we're people people screw up it's life isn't it people screw up they don't do it deliberately i'm not suggesting you do this deliberately but people do screw up um and the idea of the book right if you look what it says on the front of the book it doesn't say prince 2 it says managing successful projects with prince 2 so I would suggest if this book has any value whatsoever, and I think it does, I'll be honest with you, I think it does, then if this is how we screw up a project, surely it should give advice in, in most of these areas. And if it doesn't, what's the point of the book? So what I thought we could usefully do now would be to keep, um, to keep um, this list until we get to the end of the foundation element, which is Wednesday afternoon, by which time we'll have finished all the... All the, all, the, all the theory and we'll return to this and see if you think that what we've covered over the next few days either helps or hinders in these areas so we'll keep that and i thank you for that but it is interesting that, that you get the same thing is slightly different wording from all the groups and 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 prince is meant to try to solve some of that so what i'm going to move on to now um just checking on big am i big yeah i'm big is to suggest that um Prince 2 should help to avoid those things. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that an intelligent use of Prince 2, which I would say, I hate the words to be honest, but I suspect it is best practice, should help to avoid. Oh, I don't know if Andrew might remember this. I've been using this phrase for a long time. The list you came up with. And the list you came up with, I call them, and have done for many years, Ossing Tots. Does that ring a bell with you, Andrew, at all? Possibly not. Ossing Tots. And, and, and what you do... No, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It does, yeah. I, I, we made it up years ago. And what it stands for is this. Obviously, you read it from the top, but from the bottom up. This T stands for that. This O stands for of. This T stands for thought. The N stands for never. So we're reading from the top. The I is on its own. Um, oh, I can never remember what the S stands for, Andrew. Can you help me out here? Shucks <laughs> is the word you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shucks, I never heard of that. You know, you're running a project and you think, well, we don't know who the stakeholders are. Nobody's got, nobody knows who's doing what. 
We, we haven't got measurable documentation. We're over planning, we're under planning. We, the team aren't getting on. You know, we, we're not dealing with issues in the right way. These are all asymptotes. And what, what, what an intelligent use of Prince tries to do is to reduce the asymptote. Our lecturer referred to it not as shucks, but Never. something else with a with a H uh, and a T and an I in the middle there. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <Please? laughs> yeah, they've been around a long time, that expression. But here's the problem, and we kind of touched on this in one of our discussions this morning. Intelligent use. Because what I find, and I find it with a, when, when organizations adopt any process, there is a tendency, forgive me if I'm wrong in your organization, to think, right, my common sense will just switch off now. Um, I've been told I've got to obey, obey this process, so I will, I will just do Prince too. You know, and, and people implement it in a very um, structured, formal way. And I see it all the time. I, I you know, as I say, I'm, I'm quite often asked to do health checks, audits, and so on. And I'll rock up to a project and I'll say, what are you doing, guys? And invariably, someone will say, we're doing prints. I say, no, you're not. And they say, yeah, we do prints. We're a prints organization. No, nah, no, you're not. And they say, yeah, we do prints. I say, no, no, no. They, they think a bit more, think a bit more, a bit more in, in terms of the real world. What you're trying to do <clears throat> is to get to introduce some measure, measurable improvements into your enterprise by delivering change and Prince is a useful way of getting there. And they look at me as if I'm bonkers, which I may be. And I go, well, we do Prince work. Yeah. And it's, it's wrong. Prince is a means to an end. It has to be used in a sensible and intelligent way. Uh, um, it's like I, I do work, work with one of the charities. And this is quite a recent thing. I was asked to look at some of their risk management um, uh, processes. Uh, and I found a project manager. Hey, do you own risk, mate? And he said, oh, we've got risk register. Yeah, it's not really what I said. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, do you regularly review your risks? Has each risk got an owner? Are you comfortable with the, les the level of risk within your threshold? Um, are you comfortable with the mitigation actions? You, I've got risk register. You know, it's ticking the boxes and that's what we want to move away from. It's like when we first introduced that again, and I'm picking on you, Andrew, because I, I know you're around in these days. When we first introduced um, the, the first version of MSP program management, we, we used to say this was a, um, uh, a framework to be applied intelligently by, by talented people. And they made us take us out of the first draft. And I wasn't for where they couldn't find, where they sure where they couldn't find any talented people or not. But you, you've always got to remember, you know, that Prince 2, you know, is a means to an end. And needs to be, needs to be tailored to this project. So if it's a small project, simple project, not many people involved, be, be informal. If it's a larger outsourced commercial project, then think about the, the contractual things which are getting in the way. Um, think about you know, international projects, the level of risk and so on. Think, think, think about um, whether the style of the project, are we going to do it in a traditional way? Are we going to do iterative, incremental, agile kind of approaches? Because you can use prints in all sorts of ways. Otherwise, you end up with what I call PDO. <clears throat> which is prints in name of only. We've got loads of documentation. In fact, we've got too much documentation. Is there any good? Nah, not really. But no one can criticize it because we've got all the documentation. So if an auditor come, comes in, you can say I've ticked all the boxes. And unfortunately, that reads to pineapple, which is prints in name and precious little else. Prince takes over, dominates your world. You end up doing prints. Whereas I think if you use it intelligently, Hopefully your projects will be EPLS. EPLS, <clears throat> easy peasy lemon squeezy. Doesn't translate, I don't think, to Ukrainian, but still easy peasy lemon squeezy. <clears throat> and, and and you see it in various other ways, don't you? I don't know, I don't know about your view in life. Does anyone is anyone a slave to sat nav when they drive anywhere? People forget, you know, about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. Yeah. People forget about um, you know, the the, the things that they know. I give you a, it's a silly example just before we move into some detail on prints. I, I live on the edge of, I live in St. Mellon, so um, up near St. Mellon's golf course. And um, there's a little lane which runs through the middle of the golf course, which leads to our estate. And um, it, it's, uh, we've got a very small estate um, here, 30 houses, but it's a shortcut to a big business park. I and think I got fined there. Sorry? 
I think I got fined there. Well, not me, but yeah, my friend. <laughs> Do you know where I live? I gotta be careful now. I'm not gonna be <laughs> I don't, but it's near the golf course, so yeah. You know, do you know do you know a really scabby pub called the Heron Marsh? It's now mm, called the I can't remember it. Yeah, uh, but I live behind there. There's only 30 houses, and it's the back of the other's <laughs> golf course. But there's a, <clears throat> there's this narrow lane, which is really a narrow lane, which has got a bend halfway through it. And it's a shortcut to shortcut to the um to a business park. And there's really no need for HGVs to go down it because in 400 yards, there's Cypress Drive past Bloom's Garden Centre, which takes you to the same business park and a dual carriageway. And every year, about five or six times a year, I would say on average, we get HGVs, big, big Arctics, stuck down it because they can't handle a bend. And we've tried putting signs up saying, don't come down here, you will get stuck. And my friend that lives at the end of the estate, Phone to police, the police phone, the recovery. It causes chaos all day. Yeah, we get that a lot in Pembrokeshire. Ah, uh, do you? You, you must have heard. You must have heard the story of the couple that followed the sat nav down onto the beach in Tembe to try and get to the island that's on the other side of the sea. No way. Called the island, and they got stuck in the sand. Oh my god! They were. Oh my goodness! They literally thought they could drive across the sand and the sea to get to the island because that's what the sat nav said. Well, the sat nav said. Well, this yeah. is what happens to us. And we get, we get the police and the, and the, and we all you know, and and we I know we say to the police, what did the, why did the driver come down? He mm. said, you know what he said. Sat nav told me to do it. You know, and and the answer <laughs> answer is. You know, I, I presume if you ride, if you drive a big HGV, a big Arctic, or a big truck of some sort, you've got a quite a lot of experience of driving. You've probably driven all around the UK, uh, around continental Europe, and so on. And just because this silly little box says, go down there, go down there, go on, you've got to see what happens. You know, you're going to ignore your common sense when 400 yards, literally 400 yards, you'll carry on. And that's the trouble with prints, too. People, oh, it says in the book, I've got to do it, so I better do it. You don't. You don't leave anything out. What you do is you lighten up, you use it in an appropriate way. And that's what I'm going to try and bring out as we go through the week. And that's quite important to us. But it is a tailorable thing. So we'll keep all that stuff. Um, and we'll see how we go. Um, and I'm just going to start to use the manual in a minute and get you thinking about the manual. And I've, I've realized that I haven't even told you what PRINCE2 stands for now. So what does it stand for? Well, it stands for projects. in controlled environments. And I'll explain why the two's on the end. I, wonder, I don't know if Andrew might know this. It's shrouded in mystery, really. <coughs> um, so first thing, it's about projects, not about, well, I better make, make myself big, I think, excuse me. It's about projects, not about business as usual. But it works on any size, style, or type of project. So you can use it for IT, you can use it for construction, for HR, restructuring projects, research projects, and so on. Um, you can use it whether you're going to go for a more traditional approach or whether you're going to adopt an agile approach. You can use it if it's a commercially uh, outsourced project or an internal project. It works on size, you can work on small projects, big projects, but you have to use it intelligently. It's really, and this is what I've concentrated on this morning, about getting off to a controlled start. Setting the thing up properly, like putting a contract in place for delivering the solution. We're going to call that a project initiation document in due course. Then having a controlled progress, essentially through the idea of structuring the project into management stages. Yeah. And so there are fire breaks, control points built in. And then there's going to be a control close. There needs to be a fixed point at which um, we decide that the development has changed, has finished, and operation can start. Uh, Anna, did you say you did ITIL to me this morning? Operational? Yes. Uh, yeah, you did, you did ITIL qualification. So there needs to be a point when the project moves from development into operational activity, yeah? Otherwise, projects tend to drift on. You know, there needs to be some a point where the building becomes a home, when the website gets goes operational and so on. And, and that's what Prince 2 is all about. Yeah. Um, as I said this morning, the sort of history of it is shrouded in the dark ages now, but it, it came from something originally called PROMPT, Project Organization Management Management Planning Techniques. 
developed by a company called Simpact, Andrew. And then the team I was in uh, with some with a company called LBMS drove it towards something we called Prince. And we just called it Prince. Then after a while, and it was all government funded when UK government used to spend money on such things, uh, um, government said, oh, we, we need to control this environment. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of people claiming to know Prince and talk, teach Prince, and they may not. And we also want to license the IPR. We want to be able to make money out of, out of, out of, what, out of our investment, because training companies and all that, we have to pay money to use, the, uh, to use the IPR. But they couldn't control it because it was called Prince. And they said, you know, we want to copyright it. You know, and the intellectual property office said, you can't, you can't, you can't copyright Prince. It's a generic name. So you have to think of another name for it. And they said, well, we don't really want to lose the brand of Prince because everyone knows it. It's all organized by the treasury. This. So what are we going to do? And somebody said, and I promise you, this is how it worked. Shove a two on the end. Shove a two on the end. And that's why it's called Prince 2. You probably won't find that published, but I promise you that's the truth. And, and it's been Prince 2 since, you know, for, for a long, long time now. Um, there's never going to be a Prince 3, by the way. But what happens is every few, few years, they refresh it just to keep it up to date and so on. And the latest version, as I said, I think, to uh, all this morning is the uh, sixth edition, often known as the 217 edition. So that's, that's a bit about the history of Prince before we go any further. Um, it, it's very widely used, um, and um, there are lots of reasons, I think, why it's widely used on, on an international basis. This is a bit cynical, but what is it's free to use? There's no license fees. You could, you, you, uh, um, it's free to use. You don't have to pay any particular vendor. Ownership is now with, um, with, with Axelos. Um, you don't have to listen to me if you don't want to, and you might not. I'll be with you now, Alice. You can just buy the manual from Amazon if you want to. Uh, and why is it free to use? It's all been developed by UK um, central government funding, taxpayer, in other words. Alice, how can I help? I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned that there are uh, new updates coming on from time to time to Prince to methodology. If there are new updates, you need to uh, receive a new certificate to, pro uh, certificate to prove your knowledge in, in this update. Um, no, there are always, there are always every, every, I would say every sort of five years they, they, they'll, they, you know, they keep reviewing it, keep it under, under review. Um, there's, there's nothing imminent at the moment, I can tell you that, but you, 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 you don't have to update. If you want to stay on the register, there's a three year time scale for each of your qualifications, but you don't have to automatically do it when a new version comes out. Yeah, so the, the certificate, the qualification lasts three years. You don't lose the knowledge. It's, it depends really how important it is to you to stay on the successful candidates register. People like me need it all the time because it's our, our business. You know, we need to be verifiable. Yeah, so, does that answer your question, Oz? Uh, I ask you because there are for bus uh, business analytics, uh, the same book, there are Bar book. It's business analytics book. If there are new updates, they need to, re uh, they need to renew knowledge and uh, need to learn new updates. Is yeah, and I told just that that could they move from three to four. But no, you, it, it's a time thing. It's a time thing. Every three years, if you want to stand it, you don't, but I mean, you don't lose the knowledge. So no, it doesn't work like that in Princeton. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, there's a lot of support for it. Obviously, there's a manual um, and there's, um, there, is, there are other, other books on Prince too. There's a dummies version to Prince, but quite a lot of them on the web. Are, be careful you buy things on the web. You, uh, a lot of things are out of date. If you're on LinkedIn, there are communities of practice on LinkedIn, which are quite useful support groups. Um, there's also something called My Axelos, and you should be invited to join that in due course, which is kind of a Prince community. Uh, and you can share information and there's case studies and templates on there, but I can send you some templates anyway. So there's quite a lot of support for it. But the big thing I think which sets it apart is the, uh, from other uh, approaches, is the accreditation scheme. And the accreditation scheme is now run completely by PeopleSet. And uh, despite what you may be thinking, in order for me to uh, be able to uh, train you in Prince2, um, I have to go through a fairly rigorous uh, accreditation scheme. Um, um, and I'm subject to, to ongoing scrutiny and audit, which is quite correct too. And I have to take uh, keep my qualifications up to date. 
there is um, all, all training companies have their own courseware, which again is subject to scrutiny and accreditation. Um, so ours has been through that. And there's what you guys are, are aiming at, which is registered practitioner. And this is achieved by passing the two exams. And therefore you, uh, you get placed if you want to be, unless you opt out on the successful candidates register. So it really is, you know, um, uh, I got, a, got some formality to it. It's a very good job qualification and it's an international thing. As I say, um, I'm just about to do some more work with a company in, uh, in Vilnius. Um, in Lithuania, we'll be using Prince2. I regularly work across the world. And if we're working at a project level uh, and we're looking at traditional project management mechanisms, it's generally variations of Prince2. So what I'd like to do, if I can, um, is to get you looking at the manual and thinking about the manual and using some of our presentation material, if you will. So um, let me just share my screen for a bit and uh, we'll see how that uh, how that pans out. Um, so, mm -hmm. so this is just the uh, presentation material that I sent you, I think last Tuesday, as I recall, Tuesday or Wednesday, I can never quite remember. Uh, but this takes you through what we're doing. Um, so, um, so we've done all this this morning, what we're trying to achieve and so on. So, I'll remind you more about this later on, but this has all been done without, without looking at flipping PowerPoint, really. Um, so this is really where we started this morning, is what is a project? What is a project? Uh, how does it differ from business as usual? And there is a Prince2 definition of a project, um, which you'll find on, if you want it, on page eight of the manual. Um, it's in, for those of you in digital versions, it's 2.1. I have to keep cross-referencing to the digital version, 2.1. And this is the Prince2 definition of a project. Now, I don't suppose this will uh, bother our international colleagues on the course, but there's something on here which really annoys me. But I suspect it's because I am now a grumpy old man. Old man. Can, you, uh, can you see what might annoy a grumpy old man on that definition? Anyone see it? The Z. The Z. Whoa. When they last refreshed the manual <coughs> to bring this version out, they took away all our S's and made them Z's. So we realize benefits, we organize, we optimize, we prioritize. And when we saw the drafts, those of us of a certain, um, <clears throat> well, those of us who've been around a bit uh, said, oh, wait, this is, this is American. Where, where's all our S's gone? And the, feed, the, 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 the feedback came back, no, no, this is international. This is international. It reflects the international nature of Princeton. So it's not an affectation on my part. It's, uh, it's what it says in the manual. So you told me this this morning, to be honest, temporary organization. So we put together a team to deliver products. Now, I think we overuse the word products. Yeah, you will see that we have two kinds of products in Princeton. Yeah, one are called specialist products. These would be better called outputs. I kind of mentioned this this morning. <clears throat> when we were up here somewhere, we're over here. Yeah, the, the things that the customer expects to receive from the project are called specialist products. Specialist products. Most people call them outputs. Most people call them outputs, but Prince calls them specialist products. Yeah. There is another kind of product which we'll focus on from a bit later on, which are called management products. Management products you can think of really as the documentation which enables you to move through the project. So they don't go on and have an operational life. So things like the project plan, things like the risk register, things like the business case, these are all called management products. So you can think of it as our management and control documentation, which we use throughout the project. So there's a couple of questions there which come up in the foundation exam. What, what name does Prince do give to, to what we, what, to, what is another name, if you like, for, for outputs or deliverables? 
The answer is specialist products. And the other question is, what are the two kinds of products that we have in prints, specialist and management? Specialist are the, are the outputs which, which go into live running generally. Management products kind of help us get there. Again, more of this coming. Sorry, um, what was the second question again? What are the two kinds of products, specialist and management? Yeah. Okay. Um, they often, again, another foundation, they often stop the, stop the phrase at the word agreed and ask you what the, what, the, what the missing word or words are. And the missing words are business case. They have to be produced to an agreed business case. And quite often what they do is they'll leave those words blank and give you four choices in the foundation exam to an, to an, exist, to, to an agreed cost, time scale, plan, business case, and the answer is business case. So those are three typical questions. I'm not saying they'll definitely come up, uh, which could be asked for uh, in the foundation exam. Um, this morning I asked you, you know, the nature of a project and I asked you to pick out three, five things which de define the project. And you know, these are ones which come up all the time. We're interested, we're introduced something new or different. It's a temporary endeavor. It's got a start and an end. We have a temporary team which has got all the skills to deliver the solution. Each one is basically a one-off and we can't plan with 100% certainty. So essentially we're taking the light bulb and taking it forward, as opposed to what you might call business as usual, which is just keeping the wheels of industry turning. So business operations is an ongoing function really. Um, I asked you if you could screw up a project. I thought you were really good at that. If I'm ever looking for an old team to put together to screw up a project, I'm gonna ask you guys to do that. Um, but here's a list which we put together. I can't remember how many years this was put together now, but this tends to be the sort of classic points of failure. Not, not sure of what change we're trying to bring in. Not having a proper business case, not having a justification. Not, not really defining quality criteria and keeping an eye on quality checks throughout the project. Poor communication, um, stakeholder engagement, buy-in, poor estimating, planning and resourcing, not having the right skills. By me, it's all on your list, isn't it? Not having points where we can review how things are going, unclear roles and responsibility, and clear leadership. <clears throat> and these are the things you came up with. And generally, those are what people usually come up with. And <coughs> the point I tried to make before lunch <coughs> was why does it happen? Because we're people. People screw up. And all we're trying to do in print is giving some reasonable structure, some reasonable process, which should help them to avoid the osintops. It won't get rid of them, but it gives them some advice which has been well founded on, uh, on, on, on what could go wrong and how to overcome it. People occasionally say to me, well, why do we need project managers? Often creative people, I find. Are you going to tell us how to do our job? And the answer is, no, I'm not. You know, I work with various companies, financial companies, government authorities. I'm working with a, with a museum at the moment. I work quite a lot with museums. Uh, I worked with a theatre company last year. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell them how to do their jobs. What I'm going to do is help them get there. I'm going to help them, to help them keep control over what they're doing. You know, so <clears throat> very much project managers, they don't do the work, they plan, they get the right people involved, they keep an eye on things, and they make sure decisions are made as appropriate through the project. So it's really all about controls. And what do we need to control? Well, there's six targets that need to be controlled or managed. And the more numerative of you may recognize there's only five on that diagram, because those are the five that the project Project manager is keeping an eye on. Are we delivering everything to the right quality? Are we staying within time and budget? Are we handling the risks? But there's another one, which is of course is vitally important is, are we likely to achieve the measurable improvements? And that's much more in the remit of the executive. Yeah. So these are the six, some people call them objectives, parameters, targets that we need to keep an eye on. So watch out for the, those things because they often ask you about those in the foundation exam. 
they will throw in something which is not one of those six and ask you which of the following is not one of our performance targets. <laughs> and it could be something like maintainability, um, uh, responsiveness or something like that. Um, you do get different kinds of projects. You'll find this diagram in the manual um, on page 11. Um, I wouldn't worry about it too much for what we're doing this week, <coughs> but it's just recognition that you can use prints, <coughs> excuse me, um, with standalone projects. You often have one-off projects, um, which not linked to any particular other projects. You, in my world, in larger projects, they're often, uh, they're often broken up into uh, programs of change, which interlink. And again, you know, there's a linkage you can use with the programs or the portfolios. And you can also use projects if you've got them out, uh, prints to if it's outsourced. So again, uh, without going into much detail here, you need to recognize at the outset the nature of your project. Is it a standalone? Does it link to other projects? Is it outsourced? And therefore, how should we use prints to accordingly? Why prints to? Well, this is a very cynical view, but it's and it's a very it's not a very good way of saying it really. But why not? Everyone else does. It, it is without doubt um, the standard for prints for, for project management. Now there are there are things like the Association for Project Management Body of Knowledge and so on, which is more of a technique based thing. There are variants like Agile PM and Prints to Agile, but basically, you know, the, what is considered, I would say, to be uh, the global standard for project management is Prints to. And as I say, I do work. I'm lucky enough to work internationally. Um, we do find that Prints to is the kind of tick in the box. And if you're applying for jobs, it's quite a uh, project management jobs. I would say it's quite unusual for them not to ask for prints to as, as, as a qualification. Um, <clears throat> even if the organization doesn't use it, it tends to be the conflict. Uh, it um, it's, can be applied to any kind of project. It focuses on management. And the idea is if you embed it as a corporate standard into your organization, um, you should be, you know, it leads to more maturity of that organization because you have consistent structures, consistent terminology, consistent processes. And, and we can kind of demonstrate it works, you know, because, you know, there are case studies on the, uh, on the My Axe Lost My Prince website, which you can, you'll be invited to join free of charge, um, which, which demonstrate it. But it's also based on a number of proven principles. And this leads me into the structure of prints. And I don't think the structure of prints is played up enough in the manual. But if you were to look at um, section 1.1, which is on page three of the printed manual, so section 1.1, it talks there about the structure of prints, or prints too, gosh, I should say. I've got a habit of not mentioning the two, I'm afraid. So <clears throat> again, I occasionally get asked, so if we follow the manual from page one to the end, um, then we, is that how you run a project? And the answer is no. You have four integrated elements, four integrated elements, which have to be sort of plugged and played together. And this comes up as a uh, foundation question as well, by the way. What are the four integrated elements of Prince 2? And the answer is seven principles which are called the guiding obligations or the mindset, seven management topics, which we call themes, and a life cycle of seven processes. So seven, 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 which play together, and tailoring advice, which is in chapter four. I'll explain about the manual in a moment. Yeah. So it's a bit, I think, like, uh, you know, when you see the front, uh, when you see the overall schematic for an IKEA flat pack, or for a, a Lego, it shows you all the bits. And what you kind of have to understand, and hopefully you will through what we're doing, is how they fit together to make it work. But these are the four elements, okay? The first thing are seven principles. We've almost covered all the principles this morning without, um, uh, with, without me actually referring to them. The, these, are the, these are the guiding obligations. To be seen to be using Prince 2, you have to be applying the principles. You'll see that they're in chapter three in due course, but these, these just make common sense, I think. And I think we've covered most of them, but not all of them this morning. 
So the first one is all projects should have what we call a continued business justification. I think one of the groups mentioned that this morning about being business case led. That, you know, in other words, at the outset, we shouldn't start a project unless the expected benefits outweigh the pain of getting there. In other words, you wouldn't start a project unless there's some expected gain to be achieved from it. And there are only benefits if they're strategically aligned. But more than that, <clears throat> we've got to keep an eye on it all the way through because that's a balancing act, really. And it could be for internal or external reasons that the pain out starts to outweigh the gain or the benefits are no longer viable or no longer achievable, in which case we might scrap or adjust the project. You know, for example, if you're in a local authority and you have certain strategies and you have an election and Clyde get voted in instead of Labour or Labour get voted in instead of Liberal Democrat or whatever, then if your strategy's changed, you might want to scrap the project. If you get bought out by another company, you know, the project may no longer be relevant. Um, if funding becomes tight or a competitor beats us to it, you might want to scrap it. So a continued business justification, keeping an eye on that all the way through the project, is one of our principles. Notice it doesn't actually have to be written up as a business case. You know, it doesn't have to be a formal business case, but we have to have a clear understanding, although it generally is, we have to have a clear understanding of the, the benefits against the pain of getting there. We should learn from experience. Well, learning from experience in two ways, really. <clears throat> Firstly, have we done something like this before? So, for, for example, you know, when my friend been, builds B&Qs, he's built lots of B&Qs. They're all the same. Every B&Q is essentially the same. So he has got lots of previous experience he built the bed. Yeah. Um, and he bases his plan and his estimating on that. But, of course, they, that might prove false, as we said about assumptions earlier on. So we're always prepared to learn from experience as we go through the project. And that really links to the idea of breaking the project up into stages because we can adjust what we're doing as we go through. And learning from experience throughout the project is important too. We should have defined roles and responsibilities. Well, we're gonna cover this this afternoon. Chapter seven talks about roles and responsibilities. I've, I've mentioned two so far uh, in what we've done this morning. Um, the two that I've mentioned so far, I've only mentioned them, is the executive, which is one person, by the way. It's not, it's not a committee or a group, it's one person. Watch out for these words in the foundation and indeed the practitioner exam. Ultimately accountable individual. Ultimately accountable single. I always think of them as the single ringable neck. Yeah, Think of them as the sponsor, think of the budget holder and so on. Public sector people, I, they tend to call them the SRO, senior responsible owner. Come across that expression, anybody? Yeah, but it's what we call the executive. She or he is focused on the benefits, really. And we have the project manager who is much more focused on delivering the solution. There will be other roles which we'll discuss after coffee this afternoon. But people need to be clear on who is doing what in the project. Um, <clears throat> again, going back to what we've already covered, we always break the project down into management stages. Now, there are no predetermined, predefined stages. We have to look at each project in its own right. You know, this one I arbitrarily decided was clear out, prep, decorate, react, uh, refit, sorry. It could be analysis, spec, design, build, test. You know, you look at each one in its own right. A lot depends on the, the life cycle you're, you're going through but there are always stages built into. If I could throw this one out there without explaining it, um, there's always a minimum of two stages. I'll explain why tomorrow, but it comes up as a foundation question. What is the minimum number of stages in a PRINCE2 project? And the answer is two. But let me explain that a bit later on because we don't want to open up that discussion yet. And this is clear, this is closely allied to something which um, we call management by exception. Now, a few people this morning have talked about tolerance. Yeah? And this is where we discuss that area. Management by exception um, 
basically says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let it run unless there's a problem which needs to be which needs to be escalated. Yeah. And you know, it's like if you it's like on any journey, you know, if you're gonna go from, I don't know, uh, from Swansea up to drive up to uh, London and you plan your route and you don't change your route unless there's a problem. But if the, if your sat nav says if there's a problem on one of the two bridges out of Wales, it's closed and you'd intended to use it, you take the other bridge. You know, if you find when you wake up in the morning, they're saying that the M4 is closed because it's uh, a, a, a kind of bad weather, you might decide, I'll catch the train then. You know, or if you were going to catch the train and you read on the news, there's a train strike, you say, okay, better drive. It's basically changing the way you intended to go because of an unexpected event. It's called management by exception. Let me try and bring that to life. It's a really important idea here. Um, before we move on. So I want you to imagine if you will, <clears throat> we're running a project. So we've got an overarching high level project plan in place to take us from start to end. And it would be based, of course, on that's a great on estimates, an estimated timeline, and an estimated expenditure over that timeline. So here's our estimate at the outset based hopefully on previous experience, and it tends to be kind of cumulative escalate. Um, <clears throat> let me put some, uh, on some dates on this. Let's say we expect this project to take a year. That's our estimate. And we anticipate that we'll spend 10 million pounds over that one year. Let me just suggest that we break the project down as you do into stages. And uh, <clears throat> we're just getting to the end of the first stage. Now, during a stage, the project manager will be asked to produce regular progress reports to the project board, as you'll see. These are going to be called highlight reports. So these could be uh, the monthly report that the project manager is making and so on. They're called highlight reports. By the way, watch out for the word regular in the PRINCE2 manual and in the PRINCE2 exams. It means to us time-based. It has a specific meaning. A regular report is one which might be produced weekly, monthly, fortnightly, quarterly, or whatever. If there's a time time for pre-producing it, it's, a, it's called a regular report. So this is the project manager just keeping the project board up to date on progress. However, the idea of bringing this structure is that when we get to the end of the stage, or in fact, just before we get to the end of the stage, we trigger what we call the stage boundary. I can use a bit of shorthand there. SB just stands for stage boundary. This is, a, this is essentially a, um, um, a retrospective, yeah? And this is where we look back, look forward and so on, yeah? So it, in, in essence, it's a reality check. And this is a chance for everyone to uh, agree how things are going. So imagine if you will, we've got to this stage boundary and what we found, what we find, is we've got a cost variation, which is just a fancy way of saying we've overspent. This was what we'd expected to spend. This is what we've actually spent. So we've got a cost variation. Now, I'm sure you can see that I spend a lot of time carefully drawing my diagrams precisely to scale, because it seems to me that in that uh, period here, we'd expected to spend 5 million now, of the 10, can you see that's the expected expenditure? 
five million. And we've overspent by this much. So we spent, this is how much we've overspent by. I'm just going to look very carefully at the, at how, at the actual information. We've overspent by plus 1,097 pounds. Is that four, no, 42 pence. I think that's clear from the diagram, would you say? We've overspent by 1,097 and 42 pence. I'm guessing you can all see that very carefully. Um, do you think that's a big deal? Overspending by a thousand pounds in five million? I don't think so. No, really. That's a pretty good estimate. I'd be more popular with my clients if I could estimate that accurately, I promise you. So let's say the project has progressed now. Let's say now we're nine months into the project with three months to go. Uh, our late, so we, we had a stage boundary here, obviously, but that was okay. But our latest, our latest um, estimate is showing that we've got what is very grandly called a schedule variation. Which is just a posy way of saying we've slipped. I try to cut through all the jargon if I can. We slipped. And again, you can see, I hope from the carefully drawn diagram, we should have finished this piece of work here, but we actually didn't finish it till here. And so we slipped by plus 1.5 days. I'm sure you can see that here in a nine month period of time with three months to claw it back. Again, would you be unduly worried about that? Would you be panicking? Or do you think that's acceptable? What do you reckon? It's fine. I think it's all right. No, you know, I think we can do it. However, what if, what if we were in the middle of this stage here, let's just say we're only four or five weeks into the project and we were predicting that we may have to double budget and or double time. That our estimates, our assumptions are widely out. Would you think this wouldn't be a bad idea to just to raise your hand to your senior leaders and say, um, Houston, we've got a problem here. I think we'd like to tell you about this. Yeah, because this is a more significant deviation. So what I think you've, you've been kind of agreeing with me, I hope, that this is an acceptable deviation, but this is not. So what we have to put is some guidance around what is an acceptable deviation. And this is called tolerance. And I heard a few people have mentioned this this morning already, tolerance. And the official definition of adult tolerance is permitted deviation from the estimate without escalation. Escalation, somebody picked on that with issues, yeah? So the best way of thinking of it is kind of elbow room. You know, some more room to work within to avoid micromanagement. Now, there are different ways of setting tolerance, which we'll discuss later in the week. But in a traditional project, the classic um, way of dealing with tolerance is set a percentage on terms of time and cost, which as Gareth rightly said this morning, or really on today anyway, it's not what we do in the agile world. We don't have any tolerance on those things. But basically, this is some, a mechanism for avoiding micromanagement. So for example, if you're on the project board, and you're, you're authorizing the project manager to run this stage of the project. Okay, you've got a review point at the end and you know that your project manager's stage plan is based on estimates. You don't wanna be called in for trivial issues. The project manager, and the word is of course, as Gareth said, empowerment. The project manager should be able to deal with issues which arise within certain limits. So what you would do would be to set stage tolerance from to work with. And you say, right, project manager, we've authorized you to run this stage. During the stage, we want you to send us regular progress updates. We'll call them highlight reports, let's say every month. And because we know we're based on estimates and we don't want to get sucked into micromanagement, we will give you this, if you like, buffer zone to work within. That is yours to play with. You don't have to ask to use those. That is yours to play with. However, if you predict, if you forecast 
that you're going to go outside that, we need you to let us know, give us early warning, because that is the project going into what we call exception. So don't wait for it to happen. If you feel, if you forecast that's likely to happen, give us a shout. It's like my door is always open. And this is what we mean by management by exception. So that those tolerance levels need to be set up at the beginning of the project. They can change as the project develops, but they need to be set up. And so <clears throat> it's a means for reducing the amount of issues and other, and other, th and other, um, other events that the project board need to get involved with. And obviously, you know, it needs to be clear what tolerance levels are put in place. Um, <clears throat> and, and obviously the tighter the tolerance, the more things get escalated. So if you have a project manager you don't trust very much, you might set a tight tolerance to start with. And, and, and also, you know, imagine I'm with you a minute, Gareth. Um, if, um, for example, imagine I was running a project for your organization and I was asked to run this stage and I was given zero tolerance on money. OK, and I, it was agreed I needed to buy an extension cable for my laptop. And I looked on the web and I see PC World, Newport Road, Cardiff, Scotland for special offer, £9.99. So I'm driving back as I was yesterday from Llangennis. I'll call in and get one. And then I realise I haven't got my credit card. Not to worry, I'll call in in the morning and get them on my way into the office. When I get there in the morning, the special offer is gone, and they're now £12.99. Do I really have to escalate that to the project board? That's just bonkers, isn't it? It's just up. So, you know, there needs to be some tolerance there. However, you know, if you're working with third-party contractors, think about it. If you give them 50% tolerance on money, they're going to spend it. So, you know, you've got to be pretty savvy how you set it. But the idea is the, the project in this instance, I mean, there's several levels of tolerance you see. The project board let the project manager run the stage. They will receive regular progress updates. Just like, you know, if you're on a long journey, I'll give you a ring on the hour, I'll give you a ring on the hour. But the only reason they would need to get involved during a stage is if the project manager was forecasting that they might go outside the tolerance level set. In other words, they might go outside their empowered authority. Gareth? Do you do tolerance by stage or by complete project? So would you say like there's 10% across the whole project and then divvy that up by say there yeah, was- that, That's what will happen, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll come on to that later on, yeah. There's a diagram on page 150. Uh, yeah, we will talk about different levels of tolerance, just introducing the principle, but you are right. There's an overall level of tolerance which is cascaded down divvied out if you like yeah you're absolutely right but does that idea make sense otherwise you get micromanagement you just told me you didn't want micromanagement but it needs to be clear what level of tolerance is set and of course it can be adjusted on a stage by stage basis so it's basically if it ain't broke don't fix it let the team run it let the project manager run the stage get regular progress updates you know again think about if you're um if you're if you're on a long journey your other half might say i'll give you a ring on the hour How's it going? Oh, we stopped outside Swindon for 10 minutes, but they're saying we're still going to be in Paddington on time. All right, I'll give you a ring in another hour. Where are you now? Oh, we just came out of Reading. Oh, right, okay. You know, you don't make, you don't say I'm going to get off the train because we stopped for five minutes, you know? But if they say the train's, the train's, the train's broken down, you're all going to get on a bus. Think, oh, I better tell my, I'm going to be two hours late because the train's broken down. It's the same idea. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's what we call management by exception. Um, <clears throat> going to finish this session. Uh, focusing on products. Right. We had a few things about scoping this morning. It's important to have a clear scope for what we're doing. It came up on, on your, your ideas here. We need to have a clear scope. Um, you know, what we say is we need to focus on products. So you, you need to know what things are being created. Now we have two, we've, we're really focusing very much on specialist products here, which, will, <coughs> which people would um, we, we, we often call outputs, yeah? Specialist product. We need to know what is being delivered. And, and I, I kind of tried to introduce that this morning to an extent, when I was saying about decorating the room I'm in. If, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I got three quotes um, and it would be very easy for me to say, okay, I'm going to go with the cheapest and the quickest because that's sort of cheapskate option, isn't it, really? 
go for the cheapest and the quickest. Um, so imagine if you would, I decided to give the job um, to the guy that said I can do it for two days, 300 quid. So I had my, I'd, all I'd said to him was, I want, you know, do, will you, can you give me a price for decorating my room? And he says, sure, uh, two days, 300 quid. All right. Well, that sounds really good. Are you sure you can decorate my room for two days, 300 quid? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I say, right, <clears throat> okay. Um, but he says, you need to be aware that while I'm, while I'm doing the work, there will be paint fumes. It'll be uncomfortable. So, all right. Okay, well, actually, this weekend, this is not true. This weekend, I'm going down to Pembrokeshire to Bluestone. Uh, do you mind working the weekend? He said, no, I'm working. That'll be great. He said, if I work the weekend, you'll be out of my hair. Um, that'll be good. It'll all be done when you get back. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, I take off down to lovely Pembrokeshire. Um, and I'm driving back, and I'm thinking, I wonder if he's, uh, if he's finished the job. I'm really excited now, seeing what he's done. And fair enough, I pull in outside my house, and, my, and uh, the young lad is standing there looking very proud of himself. <clears throat> and I say, have you done it? He says, yeah, I finished about half an hour ago. It was a bit of a struggle, but I got the job done. He said, um, I'm really pleased with it, to be honest. He said, I think, in fact, I think it's one of the best bits of work I've ever done. I said, right. I mean, I said, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of decorating. And I mean, oh, he said, no, it's I think I've done a fantastic job. Come and look. And we opened the door to my room. And all the walls are, paint, are covered in graffiti, murals, tags, all that kind of stuff. I, and I say, what, 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 the, what on earth have you done? He says, what do you mean? Look at the way I blended those two paintings. So what are you, some kind of Banksy or something? He said, well, well, yeah, I'm a graffiti artist. Did you not realize that when you hired me? I said, no, no. What I wanted was wallpapered walls as a product. I want, I want woodblock flooring as a product, I want painted skirtings as a product. He said, oh, you never told me that. You just told me to decorate it. You just let me, you gave me, you didn't give me any queer, clear quality criteria. You just told me to decorate it. So I've done it. And you've got to pay me or I was, I'll get quite aggressive and send my mates around. You know, and, and that's not good, is it? We need to specify what it is we're going to create so that we know what we then need to do. And that's going to be part of our planning tomorrow. So the idea here is if we don't know what we're trying to create, <clears throat> how can we how can we resource, how can we task it and so on? And again, I think that kind of makes sense. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't just say to someone, you know, go and lay some bricks on top of each other and see what turns out. You'd say, well, we need a brick wall, two meters high, one meter long. All right. Yeah. And then you do brick laying. So it's that idea of focusing on particularly specialist product or output. And the last principle is important and we've covered it a little bit already tailor to suit the project in other words make it fit the project don't don't do prints use prints in an appropriate way you know think about how much of it you need think about how formal you need to be and so on and those are our principles which are what we generally call the guiding obligations the guiding obligations and then we have seven management topics now, it's trendy to call these things themes nowadays. All they are, all they are, is, a is, is standalone management disciplines, management topics that we give advice on. And they start in the manual from chapter six, and they go through to chapter 12. I'll talk about the manual when we've had, when we've had a coffee break. It's all right. So these are the, the seven themes. Yeah, and each of them answers a question or series of questions. Yeah. Um, and they start chapter six, chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 10, chapter 11, 12. These are often known as the raw ingredients of project management, the things that need to be managed. In other words, we need to, we need to establish and keep an eye on or manage the business case because the business case describes why we're doing the project. We need, to, we need to establish our, our roles and responsibilities. In other words, who is doing what? We need to set quality criteria and think about how we're going to review, inspect, and test, which is what we're going to deliver. Yeah. We need to think about plans, chapter nine. We need to think about dealing with risks and so on. So each of these is a standalone project management discipline, um, topic, and so on. We call them themes. And um, the guts of the manual, and to be honest, most of the questions in both exams are about the themes. So if I can get you thinking and understanding of the themes, 
then all well and good because that's what it's all about. These are the things that need to be managed. But here's the thing, you know, um, every other project management methodology talks about these things as well. They might use different terminology, but they all discuss these areas, because if you like, going back to what we did this morning, and it's all kind of, it's all kind of linked, really, you know, it's plans, it's risk management, it's roles and responsibilities, um, it's, um, it's, it's um, dealing with, sorry, issues and change, it's quality. It's what we've already covered. And we give advice in each of those. And um, most, I'll be honest with you, most project management manuals, websites, and so on stop there. They, they kind of say, these are the things that you need to manage in your project, off you go. But it doesn't give you sort of a step-by-step -step guide to getting through the project. So I always think it's a bit like if you're cooking a meal, from a recipe card or a recipe book. You know, in any recipe I've ever seen, they give you a list of ingredients and then they give you a step-by-step -step guide to what you have to do to get to the to cook lasagna and so on. And we're gonna call these processes shortly. So if we stop here, it would be a bit like having a recipe which says, these are all the ingredients you need, push on and see how it turns out. So where Prince goes further, and it's really its strength is it says, OK, these are the things you need to manage through a life cycle of processes. And what I need to get over to you is the idea of processes and our process model. And that's the last significant part of the, uh, uh, of the structure of Prince. And you really need your heads turned on for this because it's, it's, it's quite a detailed session. So I think this is a good point to grab a break. Can we get together again at um, 1455? And we'll start to work through this idea of processes. This is now getting into a bit more detail, I realize. So if we can go through this at 1455, we'll see where that takes us. Thanks, in a bit. Cheers. And we're, and we're back in the room. It always seems to be like the fast show, you know? And we're back in the room. <coughs> I think we've got everyone. So um, going back to just sharing the screen a little bit. So we have these four aspects, four integrated elements, as we say. You'll find these um, on a diagram uh, right at the beginning of the book. Just to let you know, page three, if you're in the physical version, 1.1 1 .1, uh, if you're on the, uh, uh, if you're on the uh, digital version. So the four aspects are seven principles, guiding obligations, seven management topics, each of which is called a theme, and a life cycle of seven processes and tailoring to appropriately throughout the place. So I want to try and get you thinking about what a, um, what a process is, because it's a word which is bandied around quite a lot, and people mean different things by it. So uh, I just want to get you getting the idea. A process is like a, a to-do list to run the project, yeah? So um, that, that's really all it is. It's a set of checklists which taking you through the lifespan of the project. So um, what we have in place here is a to-do list. To manage the project. But, but that's not nearly impressive enough, is it? You know, people like to use more, more grandiose posy to, um, terminology. So it's called a process model. And there are seven processes in the model. Yeah. And if we take any one process, if we take any one process, what does a process do? Well, it takes some input and through carrying out activities, creates outputs. So, you know, you can think of any kind, any kind of manufacturing activity, if you like, you know, in Port Talbot uh, Steelworks, they take raw materials, they do clever things, they make steel. Uh, in Milford Haven, they take raw materials, they do clever things, uh, and they make petrol. Um, if you go to a restaurant, 
What does the chef do? The chef takes some raw materials as inputs, does clever things, makes lasagna or chicken jalfarese or whatever. Another way of thinking about what a process is, is going to a cash machine, going to an ATM. If you think about going to an ATM, the input you put in is your magnetic stripe on the back of your card. You put your pin in and you put the service you require. Yeah, that's what you put in. That goes into the machine. The IT system there reads and validates your input. Then they'll check your account. And when they finish laughing, they prepare the output. And what comes out is obviously dependent on the service, but generally, 